Go there, it's back on. Let me sit down. Hi, welcome to the RUSD business meeting for January, not January, December the uh, 16th, 2021. On behalf of my fellow trustees, I'm Tom Hunt, and on behalf of, uh, on behalf of them and our Superintendent Hill, we welcome you. This meeting will be live streamed on the RUSD YouTube channel, and if you would like to view the meeting on our Spanish live stream, please follow the link provided on the agenda, which can be found on our website. I did skip over, and I shouldn't have. Uh, Dr. Farouk, uh, Trustee Farouk, is running late, but will be here for the regular meeting at the very least. Uh, this meeting will be held in person in the boardroom at the Riverside Adult School and is open to the public. We will be following the current state and county health and safety guidelines. The California Department of Public Health, CDPH, has issued a requirement for universal masking indoors statewide beginning yesterday, December the 15th, through January the 15th, 2022. The new order states that the California Department of Public Health is requiring masks to be worn in all indoor public settings irrespective of vaccine status for the next four weeks. For more information on the updated guidelines, you may refer to the guidance for the use of face mask coverings from the website of the California Department of Public Health. A limited overflow meeting room with television monitors is available at the main room here at the board makes capacity. And as always, the meeting will be live streamed on the RUSD, as I mentioned, YouTube channel as noted. For members of the public who would like to address the Board of Education on items of business to be transacted or discussed by the board, which means on the agenda, the published agenda, please see a staff member at the entrance and they will uh, assist you in filling that out. At this time, I will take any public participation, comments on the closed session matters that are listed. I will ask our uh, executive assistant to the board Hope I got that right, Ms. Martin. No, we don't have any. So the board will now adjourn to closed session and return at 5.30. Thank you.
or my wonderful superintendent. Good evening. Welcome. I'm Tom Hunt, president for a little while longer of the RUSD Board of Education. On behalf of myself and my fine colleagues and, and our superintendent Renee Hill and her cabinet, we welcome you to the Board of Education's organizational and business meeting for December 16, 2021. This meeting is live streamed on RUSD's YouTube channel. And if you'd like to view the meeting on our Spanish live stream, please follow the link provided on the agenda, which can be found on our website, www.riversideunified, one word, riversideunified.org. I'd like to introduce at this time our Assistant Superintendent, Sergio San Martin, to provide directions for the public uh, how to access our Spanish live stream channel of the board meeting also on YouTube. Mr. Superintendent, Assistant Superintendent. Thank you, President Hunt. Muy buenas tardes y bienvenidos a la reunión de la Junta de Educación del 16 de diciembre del 2021. Esta reunión se transmitirá en vivo en el canal YouTube del Distrito Escolar. Si gustan ver esta reunión en español, sigan el enlace incluido dentro del orden del día, el cual puede encontrar en nuestro sitio de línea en www.riversideunified.org. Muchas gracias. Back to you, President. Thank you, Mr. San Martin, as always. This meeting will be held in person in the boardroom at the Riverside Adult School, the former Palm School, and is open to the public. We will be following the current state, county, uh, safety guidelines during the meeting. As you will know, yesterday the California Department of Public Health, the CDHP, issued a requirement for universal masking indoors statewide beginning December 15th, 2021. There is no exceptions for this in this room, and this will last through January 15th, 2022. This four-week order states, quote, the California, Public, uh, the California Department of Public Health, CDPH, is requiring masks to be worn in all indoor public settings, irrespective of vaccine status for the next four weeks, close quote. For more information and updated, updated guidance, you may refer to the guidance for the use of face coverings from the CHPH and I think, or CDPH, uh, and I guess that's at their website. And we have a limited overflow meeting room, it doesn't seem we'll need it, but the television monitor will be available if the main room meets capacities. And as always, the meeting will be live streamed, and again, on the RUS YouTube channel. We, the board has returned from closed session and we have no action to report taken during that meeting. Uh, we will now have the Pledge of Allegiance, and this will be provided for us by Hosanna Miller. And Hosanna is a, uh, I'm sorry? No, is a sixth grade student from John Adams Elementary School. Miss Hosanna, Miss Miller? My name is Hosanna Miller. I am a sixth grader at John Adams Elementary School in Miss Austin's sixth grade class. I am the student council president, and I am representing my classmates. I am honored to lead you in the Pledge of Allegiance tonight. Please stand. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Miller. May we hear a nice applause for the young lady who is, uh, who is chosen by her school. <laughs> I think it's the first student I've heard do that that did it at a pace. I, Usually it's a little slower and I'm trying to keep with them, but way to go, Miss Miller. And thank you. Miss Miller was chosen by her school for her academics and her, um, her friendliness and kindness to other students and the way she stands out in that. Um, the student performance tonight will again be provided by video and will feature the Poly Chamber Singers under the direction of Miss Kirsten Walton. Miss Walton, would you bring your bearers forward, please? Good evening, President Hunt, Superintendent Hill, and members of the school board. My name is Jordan Arcos. I'm a 12th grader at Poly High School, and tonight's performance features the chamber singers from Poly High School performing Foom Foom Foom, an arrangement of a traditional Spanish dance carol and a holiday classic, Sleigh Ride, under the direction of Miss Kristen Walton. We are so grateful to be back in person and making music. The connection and sense of family that music brings was sorely missed over the last year. We are so heavily grateful to be able to share the gift of music with you. Happy holidays, and we hope you enjoy. 
On December 5 and 20, boom, boom, boom. On December 5 and 20, boom, boom, boom. Oh, John was born next night, so rosy white, so rosy white. Boom, and boom, boom, boom. In a stable, neat and lonely, boom, boom, boom. On December 5 and 20, boom, boom, boom. On December 5 and 20, boom, boom. On December the most important day, I just be gay, I just be gay. We go first to church and then we have the sweetest bums and candy. Boom, 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 boom. God will send us days of feasting. Boom, 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 boom. God will send us days of feasting. Boom, boom, boom. We can have one stand in cold for young and old, for young and old. serve to remind me, as probably does some of you, how quickly Christmas, Christmas sneaks up on us, doesn't it? i got to get to the store. <laughs> My favorite song, and I, I've been telling folks this for a while during Christmas, is the most wonderful time of the year. It's the most wonderful time of the year. Do any of you remember what the closing stanza of that is? And mom and dad can't wait for school to start again. Has that ever meant more than it is right now, and how important what we do, and what you do, and what our 4,000 employees do to keep our schools running smoothly and effectively. So I'm going to now call on some of those young people that we're so indebted to, and this would be our student representatives. These young people are uh, chosen by their high school to be the representative to the board and report on what's happening at their high school. And first, and we're, we have, uh, oh God, uh, Silali Kihada from Arlington High School. Good afternoon, President Hunt, Mrs. Hill, and members of the board. My name is Zilali Quijada, and I am proud to represent Arlington High School. First of all, I want to wish you all a happy holidays and to say thank you for all your support this year. So let's begin with some of our highlights. Since my last school report, our school's mental health team comprised of our school counselors, staff counselors, NTSS counselor, and school psychologists have done a great deal of work designing and implementing a mental health program that supports our entire community. 
highlighted by our Wellness Wednesdays activities offered to our students during our weekly office hours. Construction on our campus has recently progressed. We recently moved into our new S building that is home to both three classrooms supporting our students with moderate to severe disabilities, as well as three classrooms for our project Lead the Way Biomedical Sciences Pathway. As a part of Biomed, I've had the opportunity to enjoy this new space along with my classmates. We're all super excited to be in our new building. We've also been able to return to our completely modernized J building, which supports our long-standing media and arts academy. The auxiliary gym is almost done as well as our pool. As captain of the girls' water polo team, I hope I will at least be able to play one home game in our new pool. Speaking of sports, the last of our fall sports has just wrapped up, bringing this season to a historic end for Arlington. In water polo, the boys ended their season with back-to-back -back league championships and a first round game in Division II. Tennis also ended their season with another league championship while marking the girls' 15th consecutive year in tennis to compete in CIF. Cross country was also highly successful with an invitation to CIF where the entire girls' team competed along with the boys' captain, Austin Teal, and the superstar freshman, Brian Saramo. Finally, there is our football team. I couldn't share this month's board report without talking about our football team. Although they got off to a rough start, they had made the best out of an improbable CIF run, taking them all the way to state championships. Although that last game ended with a loss, what they won was bigger than anyone could have ever imagined. Hard work, dedication, commitment, class, and character come to mind. When all is said and done, they are CIF champions, Division 6A, Southern California regional champions, and will be remembered as the first RUSD football team in history to have played for a state championship. Lastly, I would be remiss if I did not mention the loss of our beloved campus supervisor, John de Guzman. Our thoughts and sympathies are with his family and friends. To us, Mr. de Guzman was a caring part of our community, a good friend and a jokester. Mr. de Guzman will be missed. As always, take care of yourself, take care of each other, and take care of our community. Lion Pride. Well said. Thank you so much. A little echo there. And now we have Nathan, uh, here we go, Petrotonio from Martin Luther King High School. Nathan? Good evening, President Hunt, Can Superintendent Hill, uh, and members of the board. My name is Nathan Pietrantonio, and I'm the student representative for Martin Luther King High School. Since our last report, Martin Luther King High has held many activities to help prepare our students for finals week, to get our students engaged on our campus, and to prepare for our WASC visit, which, which we completed this last month. Our Multicultural Council has been working hard to help any students at Martin Luther King High who might be struggling with mental health issues. To do this, students who are a part of MCC recently held a mental health booth on campus. This booth was the second of two campaign initiatives by our Multicultural Council. For their first campaign, MCC posted Instagram stories and resources for students. In the second campaign, members of our Multicultural Council worked with the Riverside County Health Department to become educated on suicide pre prevention and how to apply this knowledge to students on our campus. With this knowledge, MCC set up booths and provided further resources for students who might be struggling with mental health issues. MCC hopes to continue these initiatives to help students at Martin Luther King High School throughout the year. Next, our Link Crew has also been promoting initiatives to help our freshmen prepare for their finals. Link Crew started with their academic summit. During this event, freshmen who were struggling academically with three or more Ds or an F were given the opportunity to participate in a one-on-one -on -one talk with Link Crew. This talk aimed to show struggling students which resources were available to help them improve and how they can take responsibility for their performance. Another academic summit will be held for these students in the second semester to continue to encourage them and to celebrate their successes. On top of this, Link Crew, the Heritage Program, and teachers on campus have been offering tutoring to struggling students. Tutoring is available four days a week in our library for English, social science, science, and foreign language. All of these programs aim to ensure that students have the best possible opportunities to come back strong following the pandemic. Martin Luther King High School has also just completed its WASC evaluation. The Western Association of Schools and Colleges, or WASC, visited our campaign virtually to accredit our academic programs and to ensure that our students are receiving the best possible education. 
Representatives from WASC spoke with teachers and students and were able to tour our campus virtually, guided by members of our ASB using tablets. In the end, the Western Association of Schools and Colleges validated our self-study report on our academics, and the representatives who visited virt uh, virtually spoke highly about our school. Our students and staff have been working hard through all of these activities to ensure that anyone at Martin Luther King High School has the resources they need to be safe, healthy, and to succeed. Solomon Ortiz. Solomon? Hello and good evening, Board President Hunt, Superintendent Hill, and esteemed members of the board. My name is Solomon Ortiz. I am here on behalf of Abraham Lincoln High School to bring you some updates on what is happening on our campus. We had our first round of graduates from this school year at the end of the first quarter. Congratulations to the 12 students that were able to graduate. We have another group of students that will be graduating at the end of this quarter as well. We are wrapping up our volleyball season where our Panthers played against 10 other continuation schools from all over the Inland Empire. In our auto CTE pathways, students are learning skills that they can take into the job force. For example, we are working with Bud's Tires to get students jobs after they complete their certifications. In our health CTE pathways, students have been working hard to complete the CPR certifications so that they are prepared to go into medical programs after they graduate from Lincoln. Our robotics team has a new leader and are working to be ready for competition this spring. We had a successful college kickoff week where our students got information about the requirements for college, financial aid, and also set up appointments to complete registration for after they graduate. We had a cash for college scheduled where our parents came in and got information regarding filling out the FAFSA and DREAM Act. Our early impact child care program successfully passed our program review. Staff counselors provide our staff with professional development related to supporting students' well-being and dealing with trauma while continuing to provide daily support to our students. Finally, earlier this year we began the process of being recognized as the model continuation school. After a successful visit from the visiting team earlier this month, we were awarded preliminary recognition as a model continuation school and will, be, and will receive official recognition later this year. Thank you for the opportunity to share a few highlights from our school. This concludes my report. Lincoln High School. If any of you ever want an uplifting uh, experience, go to a Lincoln High School graduation. It is, it is uh, any high school graduation is great. Lincoln's is like having two cups of espresso before you go. It's just, it's just so good. And congratulations, Dr. Hill and your staff on them being a model, Lincoln High School being a model continuation. Very proud of that. Next from our Educational Options Center is Quinn Valles Pillard. Quinn. Hello, and good evening, Board President Hunt, Superintendent Hill, and esteemed members of the board. My name is Quinn Valles Pollard, and I'm here on behalf of EOC to bring you some updates on what's happening at our school. As you know, Educational Options Center is a campus that houses three RUSD schools, Rain Cross Continuation High School, Opportunity Program, and Summit View Home-Based Program. We had a successful student and staff-driven fall festival where students had the opportunity to create engaging activities that their peers took part in to celebrate the season. Included was a door decorating contest in which Room 703 took first place. EOC staff has processed approximately 270 new referrals, all seniors, to Raincross Continuation High School since August, and this is in return to all the returning students. While all students did not end up enrolling or have since left, we are arms wide open to enrolling students who need Raincross to graduate. The small, personalized program is re-engaging students in school again. Raincross High School currently has 260 students enrolled. What a great way to end their educational career in Riverside Unified. At some of you home-based program, teachers meet at least weekly with students and parents to review progress, answer questions, and plan for next week's goals. The wonderful component of Summit View is the flexibility of parents teaching their children and older students working more independently from home without scheduled classes to log into. EOC staff has processed approximately 130 new parent transfer requests to come to Summit View. The Opportunity Program teachers who work with our students who are on suspended expulsions from their school of residence provide support in areas of academics, behavior, and social-emotional. The teachers work closely with students and families to connect with students to counseling and community service opportunities to meet their conditions and be able to return to their school of residence. EOC staff have been implementing social-emotional learning for quite a few years now. 
including our Wellness Wednesdays, where teachers personalize SEL instructions to meet the needs of their homeroom students with various SEL lessons and activities. We are expanding with help from our SAP counselors, school counselors, and school psychologists through resources and themes added to the EOC Google Staff Hub. As of November 19th, 2021, EOC has had 29 graduates, with many more very close. Thank you for this opportunity. This concludes my report. Much and for hearing from EOC. And now for the Riverside Virtual School, Kristen Alvea Oreyes. Kristen? Good evening, Board President, Superintendent Hill, and esteemed members of the Board. I am excited to return and update you on the developments that are happening at Riverside Virtual School. With the conclusion of our first semester, many of our ideas have moved from a thought scribbled on a piece of paper to a discussion to actions taking place. Other than becoming an established ASB who held student participation activities, we have also began our school branding process, offered educational resources to our students and parents, and hosted two in-person staff meetings. The students of RVS successfully campaigned and voted in their first election for their associated student body. Nominations were taken, presentations were recorded, votes were tallied, and officers were elected, including myself as the sophomore class president. Class advisors will also determine and will help guide the students in receiving the necessary information relating to the school activities. ASB has also planned and implemented six activities that corresponded to the weekly spirit day, such as a holiday kahoot and an ugly sweater contest, where students were able to participate in socializing games to build community in a fun and non-stressful way. As the next semester approaches, ASB looks forward to assisting other students in the creation of other student-led organizations. In an effort to continue establishing our identity, we will use student, parent, and staff input gathered from a survey to lead us in our branding process. This information will hopefully distinguish us with a school mascot and our school colors. Being online, we want to give our seniors a memorable last year of high school. We have invited them to take senior photos, and along with the help of our wonderful site counselors, our seniors were also able to learn more about financial aid and enrollment processes during our college kickoff events. Last but not least, on November 17th, RBS was able to hold our first in-person staff meeting, where staff discussed how they can best support students, and teachers were able to create supportive and encouraging postcards to uplift and motivate our students. To keep updated with the great things happening at RVS, I welcome you to follow our social media page at RVS underscore ASB on Instagram. Thank you for your time, and I hope you all have a great evening. It's very good. Now I go to item E. December is the time of, of the year that the Board of Education, as a local education agency, must, under law, hold their annual reorganization or organization meeting, I should say. We have several items that we must take action on before we can proceed to other business items on our agenda. So please bear with us. Dr. Farouk, do we have cards submitted for any members of the public requesting to speak on any of our organizational meeting items, which would be E1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7? No, we do not. No, we don't. Then I will move forward. And at this time, I will give the gavel to Ms. Renee Hill. Thank you, Mr. Hunt. Would any bo board members like to make a nomination at this time to elect a trustee to be seated in the Office of President for 2022? I would. Ms. Delaney? I would like to nominate Brent Lee as president. Do we have a second? Second. Second. Um, are there any other further nominations? Hearing none, uh, let's take a vote then on the motion of Brent Lee for board president. Aye. <laughs> oh, every time we vote here, I'm sorry. There you go. Okay, okay. that is uh, unanimous for Mr. Lee as vice president. Our newly elected, uh, excuse me, president, sorry, thank you, currently vice president. Our newly elected board president will now take over conducting the remainder of the board meeting. 
once we have completed all of the organizational meeting action items from these current seats, we're going to take a 15 minute brief break to allow um, the officers at that time to switch to their uh, appropriate seats at the dais. Thank you, Superintendent Hill. Thank you, colleagues. I appreciate your trust, I think. <laughs> uh, uh, with that, uh, I'd like to call upon the board now to ask anybody uh, if they'd like to make a nomination to elect a trustee seated in the office of board vice president for 2022. I, I, if I may, Mr. Mr. Would, would I? Oh, thank you, sir. If I may, I would like to nominate uh, trustee Dr. Angelo Farouk. All right. Do second. A second. Second. All right, thank you. Says Alavi, are there any other nominations? Hearing none, we'll vote on Dr. Farouk to be the board vice president. That passes, five zero oh, with one abstention. Congratulations, Dr. Farouk. Um, and last, um, I'm looking for a nomination um, for anyone that would like to make a nomination to elect a trustee to be seated in the office of the clerk for 2022. I would like to make the nomination, if I may, sir. Oh, go I'm ahead. Sorry, yeah, go ahead. All right. I would like to nominate uh, Trustee Dale Kinnear to be our clerk this, for year 2022. All right. Mr. Kinnear, do we have a second? All second. All right. Dr. Farouk, seconds. Are there any other nominations for clerk? Hearing none, board, please vote for board clerk for 2022. Oh, okay, we have, uh, that still, that carries. Uh, congratulations, Trustee Kinnear, on being our clerk. All right, so uh, thank, thank you, board, for that. Uh, appreciate the opportunity to serve as president this year. Look forward to serving um, with Dr. Farouk as my vice president and Mr. Kinnear as the clerk. Um, and with that, I want to make sure we take a moment and thank Mr. Hunt for being our board president for the last year. Um, being board president requires lots of extra time and responsibility, um, but not no extra um, uh, no no extra pay and, and not too many pats on the back. Uh, and I think. Following in the second year of this pandemic uh, is, was a challenging one uh, to navigate Thanks, some of the, the, the challenges that were brought to us by the state, and just bringing our kids back. So um, we're grateful for the experience that you've brought to this board uh, and leading this board and leading this district uh, with the new superintendent um, and, and just being a leader in this community. Thank so you, the Mr. board Lee. does have a small uh, token of their gratitude for, is it extra for your money? service. Uh, we, we were trying to chip in for a new Armani suit, but uh, we came up a little short. Um, but we would like you and Jerry to have a nice dinner uh, on us. Thank you. Um, at a small business known as Mario's Place. So please enjoy that with Jerry. Thank you. Um, and too, if any of my colleagues would like to say anything, um, I'd be happy to open up the floor to anybody else. Mrs. Alvey. Thank you. Um, I just want to uh, sincerely thank Mr. Hunt. This has been a tough year. I thought that uh, it was good, tough going through the closing of the schools, but it was even more tough bringing them back. So um, you've done a great job, uh, and I appreciate the time and effort you've put into this. So thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Appreciate it. Thank you, Mrs. Alavi. Ms. Tran, did you want to say anything? Anybody no. else? No? Oh, oh. I, I will. I want to thank my colleagues. Uh, during an interesting year for their patience with me and, and with uh, what we went through. Again, as Mrs. Allaby said, Mrs. Allaby had to March the 13th, 2020, close the schools, and all the credit to reopen them goes to our employees uh, from Superintendent uh, Dave Hansen and Superintendent Renee Hill to uh, Bernie's here to represent our CSEA and our teachers and all our administrative staff. I want to comment that what a joy it has been for me and a privilege to work with Ms. Renee Hills, our superintendent. She is an excellent education leader and even a better person. She's been a, <laughs> believe it or not, a, uh, a, a tether for me. 
on, on many things, and I'm, you should be very pleased and proud that Renee Hill is, is our superintendent. I'm, and I mean that for all the staff and for my colleagues. And uh, I'm looking forward to going forward uh, with uh, under Mr. Lee's uh, leadership this coming year for the difficult task and uh, most empirical task that we have as part of the education of a community. When you lift up a child, you lift up our community. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hunt. And, th and thank you for the. You're welcome. Um, so, board, we're going to take uh, action on a few other items before we take a brief recess so that we can adjust into our new seats and they can align our voting machines um, with our new seat. So, um, item number five. Uh, the Board of Education is being asked to appoint one board member to serve as the California School Board Association's delegate representing the Riverside Unified School District, Region 18, for a two-year term. Uh, I believe um, Dr. Farouk's term is coming uh, up for expiration in March. Uh, so in accordance with the guidelines for CSBA, the board uh, does either need to reappoint Dr. Farouk or there is another delegate that would like to represent. I believe Ms. Hill has additional information on this. Dr. Farouk's good to go. Okay. I, I would like to nominate Dr. Farouk. His, his experience and um, contacts, quite frankly, in Sacramento are impressive and have been an, an attribute to our, our district. All right. Um, we need to vote on that first, and then we take the second item. Yep. Get a second. All right. And then this, the second uh, item that we... is. Mrs. Alvey is serving out um, a, a term, uh, I believe, and um, was Mrs. Alvey going to continue in that term? We're going to ask for that, see if there's somebody else that would like I to would take the place. I would certainly open it up to other members who might want to finish that term. Yeah. I believe Mrs. Alvey has served in this role previously um, <laughs> and is welcome to give somebody else the opportunity to serve in that role should someone so desire. Um, I know Mr. Kinnear, uh, is our newest member and hasn't had an opportunity. So I'm not sure if you'd be interested, sir, in serving that role. If so, I'm sure one of us would be willing to nominate you, but I'm not putting you on the spot. <laughs> <clears throat> I'd, I'd be happy to, to fulfill that role. I just have to say that I have a conflict with the May meeting. Uh, I can make sure that my calendar is clear for the, the remaining meetings in November and in uh, 2023 uh, to finish the term. But the first meeting in May, it wasn't on my calendar, and I have a conflict for that one. Okay. Otherwise, I'd be happy to, to serve. All right. And, I mean, the nice thing about having a bigger district like Riverside Unified is we do have two delegates. So um, if Mr. Kinnear is not able to go to that meeting, I'm sure Dr. Farouk or somebody can go in his place. Um, so that would, would someone like to nominate Mr. Kinnear? No. All right. So Second. We have a second. Okay, great. Um, any other further nominations? Okay, hearing no further uh, nominations, it uh, was moved by Ms. Mrs. Alvey and seconded by Mr. Hunt? Yes, sir. All right, so we can please vote. All right, that carries. Congratulations, I think, Mr. Kinnear. <laughs> All right, thank you for that. Um, that moves us on to item number six. It is recommended the Board of Education approve the certification of signatures verifying signatures of those persons who are authorized to sign orders drawn on the funds of the district and new employee authorization transmittals. Uh, I believe Mrs. Power is going to speak on this. Yes, with the new organization of the board, we must have you approve a new certification of signatures. Okay. All right. Do you have anything to add besides that before you? Move on. Okay. All right. So do we take action on that as well? Uh, a motion to approve. Second. All right. So we have a motion and a second. Board, please vote. Item six. That also carries. Thank you very much. Um, and then the last item we'll take action on prior to our recess. As item number seven is recommended that the Board of Education take action to approve the 2022 Board of Education meeting calendar. Um, Ms. Hill.
Thank you, Mr. Lee. Um, the, the board has been provided with a, a preliminary calendar. Um, but I think we might have some discussion on, on some of the calendar items. All right. So uh, anything further before I open up to the board for that discussion? Nothing further. All right. Um, I see uh, Mrs. Allaby's light on there. I was just going to motion to approve the calendar. I'll second it. Before we take uh, action, was there any uh, discussion? All right, yeah, Ms. Mr. Kinnear. Thanks, Mr. Lee. You know, mon months ago, my incorrect assumption was that we would continue with our current board meeting calendar, and I now know that that was a mistake. Uh, I scheduled a, a vacation cruise to, to Mexico from January 9th to the, to the 16th. Instead of keeping our first meeting of the year on January 20th, this new calendar conflicts with my trip. Uh, I asked my colleagues uh, to adopt the proposed calendar with one modification. Uh, could we change the first meeting to either January 6th or to January 20th? Would that be uh, agreeable to, uh, to this board uh, so that I can make sure that I participate? All right, so there's a, a request to modify the motion to move the meeting on 13th to either the 6th, which is four days after we get back from break, or the 20th, which is the third week in January. Um, Ms. Hill, your light's still on. Is that something? Oh, no. Mr. Hunt? No, I'm sorry, my light's on. I didn't mean for it to be. Mrs. Alvey? I think. Do you have something? And didn't you have a response? I was trying to. I don't, sorry, because I don't have the presidential controls, I can't see, I can only tell if your light's on. So go ahead, go ahead, Dr. Farouk. Okay, uh, I definitely want to try to accommodate or my colleague. Uh, I just can't do the 20th, I already have a, commit, a commitment there. So either keeping the meeting the same, or I could make the sixth work if, that, if, if that's amenable to my our colleagues. Mr. Okay. Lee. Yes, sir. I, I appreciate uh, those comments and I, uh, Dale, I'm willing to go on the cruise for you if you'd like, but uh, uh, I think the January the 6th is just too close to after the break. A lot of work for our, our staff, and uh, the law does provide for any member who's out to, uh, to participate to telephonically or whatever, and we would miss you. But I, if, if Dr. Farouk can't make the 20th, I, I just have concern with respect to our staff who goes on break Friday night, uh, and it doesn't come back to the third to try to put together a board meeting by the sixth. Hope you respect those comments. I don't mean those in any other way. Um, the, the, ahead, Mr. Thanks. Uh, you know the the difficulty is uh, is uh, we have a calendar that that uh, for a January meeting that's uh, that that's very 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 important to me, uh, and I know that uh, that it will be difficult to, for staff. Uh, but it's our board meeting, uh, and with all due respect to, uh, to, to staff, um, I, I think uh, to have a, a board member participate when the agenda is particularly important to that individual board member is something that I would hope that we would all consider. Is there a particular item on the agenda or just the whole agenda? Uh, the, uh, the item about, uh, about North is, is important to me. Um, that will be our first opportunity to, uh, to, to formally hear from our architects about the, the North plan. Um, the CBOC uh, applications are being uh, considered on, on that date, and uh, I think there are some others, but those are the two that stand out to me. Okay. Um, Ms. Hill, uh, is it possible for at least those two items that Mr. Kinnear has mentioned to put at a later board meeting, or my other thought is, is it possible to move the meeting to not a Thursday? Can I make a suggestion and point of sure. order? Sure, go ahead. Is that it would be proper that there be a substitute motion to Mrs. Allaby's and my second to take the calendar as, a, as appropriate, but definitely think of it. Well, I was just going to see if there's any other further discussion on trying to accommodate yes, a different date. But and Mr. Farouk will not be here on the 20th. I understand. Yeah. Um, 
So that's why I was saying, what is the board's thoughts on either moving the two items of importance to Mr. Kinnear that he wishes to be in person to participate on? Yes. If that's possible, Ms. Hill, or could we move the meeting to a non-Thursday? Or if, does the board even think that's a good idea? One other item. Sure. I guess I'd like to hear from our superintendent. Uh -oh. To, uh, to what to what degree would uh, moving the meeting uh, to the uh, uh, January sixth uh, be uh, so disruptive to the school district to accommodate for a board member who's particularly interested in that agenda? Would you mind? Thank you for Mr. Would you mind answering answering my questions first and then answering Mr. Kinnear's question? Sure. Um, we. Could move the topic. Um, we could. Yes, we could move the topic. That's possible. Um, and a not Thursday really would be dependent on your calendars. We'd have to talk about propose whatever dates and then see if people can meet those. And as for being uh, prepared for the sixth. Um, some people would, because uh, people are normally taking their breaks from after Friday through um, the third. So uh, at least the executive assistant to the board and anybody with a presentation would have to do some things over the break. But we serve at the pleasure of the board. We'll make it work if the board chooses to meet on the sixth. Um, you might want to make a consideration to the um, board agenda reviews would, would be earlier in that week. Uh, and the, uh, the um, agenda would be posted before you had an opportunity to have your agenda review. All doable, but just considerations for that earlier date. Did that answer your questions? Yes. All right. Um, I'm going to take one more stab on it, and then we can... Either vote or move on. Um, does the board have their calendars with them? And would the 12th or the 19th be feasible? Can you get back, Mr. Well, the 12th does not work. Yeah, you're gone. You're gone. The 19th? 19th, I can make work. I couldn't hear Mr. Kinnear, I'm sorry. The 19th works for Mr. Kinnear, is what he said. 12th, obviously, he's still gone. Give me a moment. I'm sorry. I didn't, I'm sorry. I didn't, I'm not sure I understand. So what are we looking at now? I'm sorry. I was just seeing if we could move, if if the meeting is scheduled for the um, 13th, and that doesn't work for Mr. Kinnear, and then the proposal was the 20th, and that doesn't work for Dr. Farouk, um, the 19th on a Wednesday would doesn't, work. Doesn't work for me. The 19th. All right. So, all right. Well, Mr. Mr. Kinnear, would you mind if we move those two items to I think the, there, there are two items that, that I think are, are timely. The CBOC applications are, you know, we're past due on, on those applications. To postpone it uh, is, uh, is a bit troublesome. Um, the, the, the North plans, I don't know to what degree that puts a kink in, in a schedule. Um, so. Okay. I guess I'd still like to consider the, the sixth. Okay. Salavi? Um, my, my feeling is that um, usually for board members' optional vacation plans, we don't need to change the schedule. And though I'm sympathetic, I don't think we should change our calendar. And I do think we should try to move those two items to the following meeting. All right. Um, so I think everyone's had a chance to participate. Um, there was an original motion, but then there was some more discussion. Um, so, Mrs. Alvey, do you want to change your motion, or does somebody else want to make? No, motion? the motion still stands to accept the calendar as is. Okay. And remind us all too that Mrs. Alvey is called in from uh, several places out of town. I believe you did one time from your hotel room. Uh, might might be hard for her on a boat. But. Yeah. Well, I, I know I, I understand yeah. that, but the Brown Act 
recognizes this could happen and uh, of course the the calendar isn't going to be the same every year because the calendar isn't the same every year so well, I would call for the question. We have, we have a motion. Do we have a second? I have second. Mr. Hunt has a second so there's a motion and a second um, to approve the board calendar um, and I'll just add that I will work with the superintendent to make sure those items um, are, are moved to an, another meeting as long as they don't disrupt the schedule on those two, two items. All right, so I call for the vote. All right. That counts. Looks like four yeses, one no, and one abstention. Um, that was for Mr. Connor and Jordan Epstein. All right. All right, with that, uh, we will take a brief 15-minute 15, 15 recess to allow staff to assist with the new 2022 board officers taking their assigned seats. We'll be back here in uh, by 6.33. I'm going this way. All right. Not my new seat.
Um, on our next item on the agenda. Is that echoing? Yes, it is. Is it just me? All right. I think they fixed it. All right. Um, next, Dr. Farouk, did you have a motion you wanted to make? Yeah, I'd like to motion Q1 uh, to be the next uh, agenda item, and then followed by... I, I'm, rec I'm motioning for Q1 to be the next agenda item, followed by Q6, and then the remainder of the normal schedule. All right, Q1, it's our student board member election process, and we have all three of our student board members here this evening, um, and I think most of them are celebrating their last final before uh, we end the semester. Um, is that okay with the board? We have a second? I second. All right, can we just do a show of hands if that's okay? All right, perfect. All right, Dr. Perez, I believe you're the lead on this. And then P6, which will follow this, uh, is the discussion on North High School. Good evening, President Lee, uh, Superintendent Hill, and esteemed board member members. I am very excited to introduce our student board members who will be providing the entire presentation for the proposed 22-23 student board elections. So the three of them will be coming up and we'll be starting off with uh, student board member Luna Nam, and then Jordan Henovea, and then Emily Torres, as the presentation comes up as well. Good evening, Mr. Lee. Um, Ms. Hill and the student board members. Today we are really excited to be talking about our recommended election process for the school year 2022 to 2023 and the timeline as well for the next elected student board members. Next slide. So currently some roles and responsibilities a student board member holds is that they are actually recognized as a full board member during a whole one year term. So currently that is me. Jordan and Emily, we, are, we all serve on the dais um, trimester-wise, so we share it. And But at the same time, we still all have preferential voting rights. We can all make motions as needed, or we can also bring up agenda items that we want to speak on that's not on the agenda. And other perks that we also have are that we can attend other functions, or we can also be part of committees as needed, and if we want to be in it as well. So this is a really big role, and as RUSD have, has 42,000 students in general, we want someone that can be able to represent all those student voices and their needs as well. So a big issue that we had with the, um, the prep past student election process is that we weren't able to really have students be involved during this election process. So we want to make sure that we're upholding this um, ideology of shall be chosen by students so that students also can be, be part of this democracy where they get to elect someone of their choice to represent them on their behalf and serve as a liaison. So we got several input from different sources as well to make sure that we are on this um, on the same the current path and also to make sure that we are maintaining our mission as well to make sure that we're upholding this student voice, student involvement. So a couple of our inputs were from the student superintendent student advisory committee. So we actually all attended the most recent superintendent student advisory committee meeting and we presented our proposal for the new uh, election timeline as well as the election process and we all we also asked um, the students to answer a exit poll and during this exit survey we got a lot of feedback that students were surprised that they were not aware of this position and they were also really excited to be part of this election process as well then we also have some input from ourselves as the current board members we are really honored and privileged to have this position in within us we also recognize how um on a big learning experience this is and we want to make sure that any students at rusd can have an access or have an equal chance for this position if they're in interested in education and they have a passion for leadership as well. Next we'll be discussing a big portion of our influence which came from student and staff surveys. These were um, filled out by staff members, students, principals, and anyone in the RU RUSD district community members and Jordan will be discussing more on that. Good evening members of the board. My name is Jordan Henovea and I will be covering the feedback that we received from the student and staff survey. 
First is the election process, which was very much encouraged in our findings and for feedback. Each school site will have the same process and students will be chosen to sit on a panel that interviews potential student board member candidates. The candidate pool will then be narrowed down to the next step for candidates and that will be a review, um, an interview with student board members where the final candidates will be chosen for the following year. This idea was largely supported in the survey and characteristics that community members would like to see for student board members are someone who's open-minded, well-spoken, and a good communicator. Uh, the, G the GPA and grade level of student board members were determined to be a 2.0 requirement and eligible for juniors and seniors. The GPA was adjusted to a 2.0 so that many students would have the opportunity to apply for the position. So yeah, so many people could apply for the position. And it's eligible for incoming juniors and seniors so that students have the ability to see the change that they get to make on campus in the following year. So they could also see what works and what doesn't. Key characteristics and the election process will be discussed in the next slide. Criteria that applicants will, will be facing are two required letters of recommendation from staff members at their high school and one letter from a community, a community member, which is optional. Um, that could entail someone from their job or someone from their church. It's really up to the student. And qualities that we are looking for is that students exhibit a level of, pro of professionalism so that they could sit in on meetings, that they're a problem solver, they're open-minded, responsible with their work and their time, they're well-spoken, inclusive, a good listener, and that they advocate for student voice in their decision-making process. And some essay questions that we will have in the application are, why do you want to serve as a Riverside Unified School District student board member? And what do you hope to accomplish during the year of service? And what is your de definition of equity? And how do you see that being enacted on your campus? And some other questions. And from there, I will hand that off to Emily Torres. All right, thank you, Jordan. Good evening, board. And I will be presenting the recommended process, timeline, as well as our next steps. So first here we have, um, I wanted to say that student voice is an important part of the election process as discussed before. So first off, um, when we start, the students, interested students must attend a 45 minute meeting outlining the, outlining the application, interview process, and timelines. This will take place during January and at a reasonable time where students are able to attend either after their possibly seventh period or after extracurricular activities after school. Next, uh, we have the actual application, which will be open district-wide to the classes of 2023 and 2024. This would be juniors and seniors. This would be open from January 31st to the 9th. Then we have, um, after that, the applications to be reviewed by a committee. Um, they would be reviewed and ranked by a school team of student leaders and staff members. This would take a couple days, so um, things can be finalized. From there, we have that the application, the applicants who meet the requirements are going to be asked to go to a site interview, which would be held by current student leaders, um, staff members, and possibly ourselves also. This would be held during the first couple weeks of February. From there, we have the in-person interviews that are held at each school site for applicants who meet the criteria. From there, school the school interview team would be composed of an administrator, teachers, counselor, and school student leaders. From there, one to two finalists would be selected from each school site to move on forward for the final interview. For the final interview, finalists would be interviewed by the Board of Education members, including current student board members. Then three new student board members would be selected to serve during the 2022-2023 school year. Here we have the recommended timeline. Um, it's just a summary of what was just discussed. So during the, during January and February, the application window would open. From there, the, the site interview would be held during the middle couple weeks of February. From there, in March, the final interview would be held with the Board of Education as well as current board members. And then from April to May, student board members would be selected and introduced. 
Now, our immediate next steps are to update the application with any additional feedback that you provide us, create common tools for reviewing applications, and communicate this process and timeline with high schools district-wide. This concludes our presentation, and we can open it up for questions and comments at this time. Thank you. All right, thank you. Thank all three of you for that. We appreciate it. Uh, before I open it up to my colleagues for public input, do we have any, um, before I, for, the, for board member input? Yeah, presently we have uh, one uh, request for addressing the board. Item. Okay. All right. All right, so first, Sandy R. Good evening, you have three minutes. So I just want to say that um, the girls did an excellent presentation. I love their recommendations. It's nice when you have a, you know, clear-cut selection process where you know exactly your timeline, what the criteria is, whether you're going to be interviewed. It would be amazing if this board used the same kind of selection criteria for their Citizens Bonds Oversight Committee that oversees the spending and whether the spending was actually um, appropriate for $400 million of our taxpayer money. So maybe the girls could give you guys some input on how to set up the criteria for the Citizens Bond Oversight Committee, because I requested it and all I was given were the bylaws. There is no selection criteria. You want to talk about the they did an bond amazing presentation. Thank you. You can take public input. Thank you. All right, that concludes public input on this item. Are there any board members that wish to speak? Ms. Alvey. Thank you. Thank you, Jordan and Luna and Emily. You did a great job. I just came back from a school board conference and there was a session on student board members. I'd like to ask you guys a couple questions about how, how you discussed these different options. One is you've decided to keep three uh, board members per year. How Did you talk about that at all? Because that came up at the conference as being um, that, that one school board member was more desirable. And I wondered how, what your discussion was like about that. Thank you for your question, Ms. Alavi. So regarding the reason why we still wanna have three board members current, just like we have it right now, is that we get to sort of um, divide and conquer and also um, have our time, like management, manage our time more properly. With one board member, they're required to attend every single board meeting and also attend any um, any events that are needed as a student board member. But as a high school senior or a junior, they're gonna have a lot of other things on their sides as well, regarding personal issues, extracurricular activities and stuff. And since we have three board members that we can lean on, we can sort of um, just sort of like, I would say delegate our assignments and stuff as needed. So I, we would like to keep the three student board members. No, I, I appreciate that a lot. I just wondered, you did talk about that. Oh thing. yes, okay. definitely. The other thing um, I, was at, I wanted to ask your opinion about was we had set the system up to give alternating fairness to different schools. How, is, how, how are we going to fairly um, spread the wealth, if you will, to all the schools in our district? I mean, did you talk about that at all? Okay. Um, we decided that it would be similar to how it's conducted this year, where um, students from, from North Arlington and King wouldn't have the opportunity next year. It would, it would be going through the other school sites so that they have a chance to have representation on the board. Terrific. Thank you very much. Good job, girls. Thank you, Mrs. Elvi. Dr. Farouk? Thank you, President. Thank you, President Lee. I feel like my mic is. Uh, I just really want to express my appreciation and gratitude for you guys, not just for your individual leadership and service, but for you guys to be so proactive to reevaluate the entire process and go through this very deliberative process. Very thoughtful. I was I was only going to ask that second question that my Trustee Alvi did, so I, I have nothing to say other than just really appreciate uh, your leadership and uh, look forward to going through this. Uh, this new process moving forward. Thank you, Dr. Farouk. Mr. Kinnear? You know, I echo the comments about uh, you, you guys doing a great job. I guess I'm a little confused about alternating um, uh, the opportunity for uh, schools to be represented on the board. Um, I didn't see that in 
in the criteria that you have up there, would schools that are currently represented still go through the interview process and the application process? Uh, or, I'm, not, I'm not sure how that would work. Did, so no, for example, um, our schools, Arlington, King, and North, would not go through the application process. They would not go through the interview process because they wouldn't um, be able to become student board members. That's why we would have all the rest of the other school, high schools of RUSD have this opportunity and they would um, go through the application process and interview process. And to add a little bit onto that, Mr. Kinnear, the re usually the student board member was only for seniors, which would also, that would sort of make some schools not have the ability to even try at all for that process because at that certain year, their schools are not allowed to apply, but they're, you know, a rising junior and they can apply. That's the reason why we decided to open up the student board member selection to juniors and seniors. So you still have a, at least one year of a chance to apply. Um, so you can either apply as a junior or a senior. Great, thanks for clarifying that. My only suggestion would, would be that we get we put that in writing so that, uh, that that's there for everyone to see. Thank you. Mr. Hunt, did you have any comments on this? No. no? Um, all right, I do have a question. I, I just appreciate what they've done and uh, having student members active is very important. Uh, to be, uh, for the final interviews. How is that committee gonna be comprised um, how are the folks that are on the committee selected? So regarding how we're gonna be selecting our interview panel members, first of all, for the staff members, we're gonna to try to have activity directors, coaches, any staff members that are probably gonna know the school well or have been at the school campus for a long time so they know the school culture more. Then regarding the student leaders that we will be appointing to the selection committee, we wanna ensure that they also know the school culture as well and they also know and have a general idea of what's gonna be the best for their school. Thus, we're trying to, um, we're probably gonna have the criteria for those panel members to be juniors and seniors who are also in academies. So whether they're in like a, a CTE process pathway, they've been in a National Honor Society member for three years. Um, so there will be some kind of requirement like that to make sure that they're also involved in the school, to make sure that they're knowledgeable and you know, uh, they, they require those necessary skills to evaluate someone to lead them. But there'll be some like clear um, direction on who's comprised yes. so yeah. from school to school. It's yeah. mm -hmm. similar and fair, okay, yeah. all right. Um, and then just one more question. Uh, when, as you got to this recommendation, um, was there a discussion about uh, a process in which each school would, the, school, the students at that school would vote on who they would like to be their representative before that final interview process? So we mainly just wanted to minimize the popularity vote and things like that. So that's why creating the committee, um, from there they would be able to vote to see who would go on to become the one to two finalists and then go on to the um, site interviews and then also the final interviews with the Board of Education as well as current board members. Thank you, thank you very much. All right, is there anybody else before we conclude this item? Dr. Perez, this is just a, uh, not just a, this is a presentation proposal. I, just so we'll come back to the board. No, it is not oh, going to come back to the board. it's not going to. Okay, mm -hmm. we don't need to do that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Great, so this will start in January. Absolutely. All right, well, we look forward to uh, this process and getting your feedback uh, as, as it happens and um, see who's our next student board members after you, you three. So thank you, thank you all. Let's give them a, a round of applause. All right, thank you Dr. Perez for taking the lead on that. Um, Dr. Farouk, when you asked for this item to be brought forward, did you also intend for yes, P6, P6 I, to be right after I this? Put it, yeah, that's okay. what I said. All right, so um, item P6, uh, which I believe is part of the uh, action, All right? So yeah, item P6 of uh, it's recommended that the Board of Education take action on adjusting allocations in the district's capital facilities program. Um, so I'll give the public a moment um, to find that in their agenda and possibly get a card for public comment. And while we're doing that, Ms. Hill, 
if you could please um, give us give us some insight on this item and why it's before us tonight. Thank you, Mr. Lee. Uh, this item is related to direction that the board gave at the October 7th board meeting. The staff provided an update on the district's capital facilities program and the board allocated 187 million out of 190 million total pro projected funds. Uh, when we look back um, at the allocations and reviewed the motions that were made that night, the funds were not adequate to sustain both the project allocations that were stated and the overall program contingency that was included in the statements. So the staff is bringing a recommendation um, to allocate the balance. So 187 million out of 190 was allocated. So that $3 million balance plus dollars from the overall program contingency to um, bring the North High School project to the intended dollar amount that was stated in the motion. Um, so there was some uh, confusion about uh, the ESSER dollars, whether they were in the, in the projected 190 million funds or not. And I think separate from that, when people were talking about a $50 million figure, some people were including the 11 and some people were not. So this evening, staff has a recommendation. Yes. And that is yes, to allocate um, that contingency fund, which is not allocated to any specific project, but uh, to, to allow for any kind of flexibility in, in, in projects at particular sites and take yes. those funds and allocate them uh, to, to uh, ensure that the, the project list that was mentioned in the motion are funded to, in which the board intended. Yes. Okay. That's staff recommendation. Okay. All right. Um, is there anything else from staff? Mr. No? All right. Do we have any comments from the public? It looks as if we have uh, six or seven uh, comments. All right. Sounds good. All right. So, um, We'll hear first from Sala uh, Ponich, and uh, you have three minutes, Ms. Ponich. Welcome. Uh, thank you. Uh, I disagree that it, there was any confusion about the amounts of money that were uh, approved in Dr. Farouk's motion, so I really have only three words to add to my statement, which is find the money, all of it. I know that's five words, but I really can count. <laughs> <laughs> all right, short and sweet, thank you. Uh, next, uh, Rich Davis. And after Mr. Uh, Davis, uh, Anthony Noriega, followed by Yolanda Esquivel. I'm sorry. First, I want to uh, address uh, Trustee Hahn. I want to thank you for the time you served as president of the Riverside Unified School Board. I'm sure you extended more time and effort as a leader of Riverside School Board than uh, what you were expected to do, and I want to publicly express my appreciation to you. Personally, I will miss having you as board president. You have provided me with great quotes, and I will miss that. President Lee is a man of very few words, so that would be challenging for me. Trustee Hunt, five board meetings ago, you directed staff management to provide me a financial reporting measure. Oh, <coughs> I didn't receive it. At the last board meeting, I informed you that I hadn't received the report. You directed district management again to provide me the financial reporting. As of this board meeting, <coughs> I am still waiting for that report. So I asked members of the board, 
who is running the district. Perhaps, Trustee Hunt, this is just another example of the many times you have promised me things and for me to be patient. Promises made, promises broken. Such delays have become very clear to me, to community leaders, and to your constituents throughout Riverside that RUSD is not, will not be truthful and transparent in their financial reporting. At the October 7th board meeting, a lot of time was spent trying to prioritize the spending of 100 million measure old funds. A motion was finally made by Trustee Farouk, and you all unanimously approved them, his motion. And now appears that not only was Trustee Kinnear considered confused, but you all must have been uninformed. What a waste of time for you and all of your constituents who had to sit here and now who must come again tonight because district management neglected to provide even you with pertinent and up-to-date information in order to move forward in making critical decisions. Trustee Hunt, you commented during the meeting that we have to get this right. It is hard to get things right when you're not given full details. I ask again, who is running this board, this district? As a taxpayer paying for Measure O, we deserve a thorough reporting on what the project was budgeted, the ending costs of each project, including other sources beyond Measure O, and future projects that are earmarked. You have made it very clear that another school bond measure will be needed. As of today, any new proposed bond measure, state or local, will be strongly opposed because RISD has shown that it lacks transparency and cannot be trusted with our tax money. Thank you. Mrs. Hill, there is, Superintendent Hill, excuse me, there is no reason that this gentleman who has asked for this, and I asked for last meeting, hasn't received this report. I know tomorrow's the last day, but would you make that a priority? No, sir. Not wait, yet. sir. Not Good yet. evening. Uh, no, before wait. I get started. No, no, no sir, yet. wait. I'll call, you, I'll call you up, sorry. We're just right. gonna, we're gonna have a question about Mr. Davis. Okay, just a minute, thank you. Sir. Would, would you make sure Mr. Davis gets that? Yeah, I, I, I do think, Rich, you overstated a little bit, but he's right that, uh, if, if a citizen is asked for that kind of clarity, it should be ready available. It's, it's what Mr. Kinnear and I have been talking about, about the Oversight Committee needs tuning up at least on an overhaul. So would you make sure, please, I know that information has got to be available. Please it make is, sure Mr. Hunt, and I believe that Mr. Davis did receive some information. Um, well, it, it, he doesn't think he did. Would you just make sure before the, I, Rich sticks around? Just I'll miss you too, Rich. Uh, just that he we get clarification on that. That isn't. Uh, I'm sure Mr. Davis is. Yeah, and if it's been sent, maybe just resend yeah. it from your computer if but you have access to it right now. Whatever's needed. Right. I'll do that, Mr. Hemp. Thank you. All right. Thank you for your patience, Mr. Noriega. Go for it. Go ahead. Uh, good evening. Uh, before I get started, uh, I'd like to extend a happy holidays to all of you and your families, and we have a prosperous new year. Um, here tonight, uh, my name is Anthony Noriega, as most of you know, I'm with the Eastside Task Force and a member of LULAC. Uh, I'm here today to uh, strongly oppose uh, the uh, the um, opposition to the Metrolink platform expansion project. We believe it's bad for the east side. We believe it's bad for the parents. We believe it's bad for the children. The air quality control in Riverside is already bad, as you all know. Really and it's only going to get worse with that project coming on board. I'm going to pause your time just for a second. This item is related to P6. Uh, we are conducting a preliminary review of the draft Mr. environmental Noriega. impact report and the environmental Mr. assessment Noriega. report and find it lacking in addressing the long term. Excuse me. Sorry. I was trying. I'm not sure if you can hear me. We're, we're talking about item P6, measure O allocation. We're not talking about the Metrolink right now. No. Oh. Oh. Can you hear me? This item is on P6. Public comment will be after this item. Is there a speaker? Mr. Davis, could you hear me okay, when I was talking? Okay, thank you. Is it, the, is it our technical issue? Uh, I'll call you back. Okay. All right. Thank you. 
Right. It is, it, I have a question. Is just on our agenda, the, I know we're, we've been participating in what Mr. Norag is talking about. We have similar feelings. He does, and I'm sorry, do we, uh, being the president, do we have this item on our agenda or is it during your comments? So he would, during public comment, he, he, yeah. he could, so yeah. Mr. Mr. Just wanted Mr. A, if you would explain to Mr. Noriega. I don't think he can hear me. He can come up. Can someone from staff mention that to Mr. Noriega? Thank you. All right, Yolanda Esquivel. Make sure you turn on your mic there, Mrs. Esquivel. Oh, thank you for reminding me. I always forget. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. But uh, good evening, uh, members of the board and staff. I, uh, I have to say I, it's been a very difficult day for me today, but I'm here. I made every effort to be here. But I, you know, I just have to say that um, I expected for some of the money uh, allocated at the October 7th meeting for our east side, Casablanca and North High, to be taken away in some manner or for whatever excuse. We didn't celebrate when the money was allocated. We didn't, because we expected this. And uh, what I didn't expect for this money was uh, to be taken away so quickly, so quickly. We hope that you have found the 11.5 million elsewhere in the budget and hope you keep your promise. It appears to us you have no reservations about taking money away from our east side schools and North High. That is exactly the reason why our communities lack two schools, two elementary schools, and its high school is in such terrible condition that it needs 157 million in reparation. You say you need to find the money. Well, please look elsewhere, please. Don't take it away from the most deprived community in Riverside. It is not our community's fault. There is plenty of money in the reserves you have for a STEM high school which no one except a few people want. You really have no business stashing away money for a STEM high school when you cannot afford it. All the money you have allotted for this STEM school belongs to the East Side and to North High School. You have been depriving their educational needs for generations, generations. We need equity equity for our children. It's time that you do the right thing. If other board members made mistakes, it's up to you to correct it. Please do the right thing. And you know, it, it doesn't help any. It doesn't help any in our confidence in you when we sit here and see how you vote against the request of Dale Kinnear. He is the only one that has started to bring up these issues. And it doesn't help in our confidence at all. So please. Thank you, Mrs. Esquivel. <laughs> Shirley, Shirley Tribble, followed by Sammy Luna. Good evening, Ms. Tribble. Don't forget to, no, take your time. Don't forget to push the light when you get up here. Good evening, all. I'm here, I'm a little confused about uh, the air conditions with all the COVID and all everything that has gone on this year. I want to have you as a board think about this. What are you really doing for the children on the east side? I was born and raised here in Riverside. I've seen all the changes. I went through the civil rights movement. I've seen everything. I've seen being locked at North High School when riots started at Ramona. I've seen everything. But you know what has happened? It's seeming like we're going backwards instead of forward. The Bible tells us 
don't harm my little ones. And you are harming our little ones. God said, don't do that. Protect his little ones. Put them first, and he'll put you first. So this is for you. If you want to make Riverside better, you better open your heart. Don't just think out about who's going to get benefit this and who's going to overcome this and what will happen. You better start thinking better because times are not right right now. We should not be standing here talking about what North High School needs after all these years. That school is just terrible, terrible. And yet, here we are talking about pensions of money. $50 million when they need $150 million. So, as again, this is going to be on your heads. Someone else is looking with more power. And it's going to be on each and every one of you to make. We heard that you said, you know, bottom line, $50 million to North. Uh, it was clarified by Dale Kinnear that 11.5 million for the HVAC, which again is not enough to cover the HVAC at North, I hear, which is disappointing, um, was in addition to that 50 million. Here we are revisiting that. Um, I would, I just hate continuing to meet you guys under these circumstances. I, I didn't think I'd have to revisit this. It's very disappointing. Um, sharing the same sentiment as everyone else. North continues to be neglected as the East Side does, um, and it's heartbreaking. Um, but uh, I'm here again to fight for North, uh, make them whole, make those students and those teachers um, and the community feel like they're a part of this city, um, like the other high schools do. Um, I, I'm sure you can find the money Money tends to appear multiple times for different reasons in this district, so um, I'm hoping that you guys find that. Um, I'd also like to propose that, uh, you know, you look at this as an opportunity. Why don't you meet with UCR leadership and figure out another way to fund the STEM school? I understand that that's important. Um, even bigger opportunity, why don't we make it at North High School. It's just down the road. Let's, let's, let's make a difference there. Let's, let's show other communities that there's a way to make a difference at a, a East Side community that is, you know, falling apart. You know, you have this prestigious university right down the street. Something can happen. I know you guys have communications with the leadership there. There's a way for something to happen. Maybe reach out to Borns. Borns also is very into STEM. You know, make it a group effort. This is something that can be a great opportunity, and you guys will be extraordinary. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Noriega? Okay. Don't forget to push the mic on there, sir. Maybe I need to peel out three or four cards. The district has a disturbing history when it comes to the East Side community. Promises are made, but not always kept. The fact that we are here tonight is troubling and has caused the community to question the intentions of Superintendent Renee Hill and the Board of Trustees. On 7 October 2021, the board cast their unanimous vote to allocate North High School $50 million plus on top of that, 11.5 for the Havoc uh, renovation of the system. Yet, even before the ink dried on the boat, Superintendent Hill claimed that Trustee Kinnear was confused, she claimed. 
that the 11.5 million for the havoc was included in the 50 million dollars. Unfortunately, the only person that was confused that night was Superintendent Hill, as both Trustee Baruch and Kinnear made it clear that the total amount approved was for the 50 million for North High School reno North High renovations plus the 11.5 for the havoc repairs. Trustee Farouk is right, and I thank him that the Board of Trustees needs to stand firm with the commitment made to the Eastside community. Uh, Dr. Farouk, I thank you for standing up for the Eastside community and alongside with uh, Dale, uh, Trustee Kinnear. For the past year, Trustee Dale Kinnear, Rich Davis, and other and other members of the Eastside Task Force have been calling for an accountability and transparency of measure of fundings and for all other sources allocated and spent within the district. To date, we have not received a report. Promises that a full report is forthcoming in January of 22 is pragmatic at the least. If the board is ever to gain the confidence and the trust of the Eastside community, they must move forward with calling for an independent audit of all funding, expenditures, allocations that have been made for the last 10 years in order to ensure that the community, that, that there has been an equitable distribution of the funds of all schools within the district. The Eastside community looks to all of you to ensure that the vote cast on 7 October is not reversed and is not modified. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Noriega. That concludes public input for this item. I will open it up to the board uh, for their comments. Um, Dr. Farouk. Thank you, President Lee. I I'm going to be very brief. Uh, I just want to express the uh, passion and appreciation from the community on this issue, and it's unfortunate that we have to have this discussion. But for me, there was nothing ambiguous about the motion that was made. Uh, and that being said, the there's Money doesn't need to be found in the, uh, there was three million unaccounted for in the uh, uh, original motion, and eight and a half million dollars from the contingency funds that were provided. The combination of those would offset the HVAC amount uh, and make the uh, follow through on the commitment that was made unanimously by the board. So I would motion for three million dollars from the unaccounted and eight and a half million from the contingency funds to go to North to resolve this unfortunate matter. Mr. Hunt. Okay, I'm, I'm not going to be brief because I'm a little tired of getting beat up up here. So I want a little history. First of all, tonight, this has nothing, Yolanda, to do with the East Side Elementary School. Sammy, this has nothing to do with the STEM school. Nothing to do whatsoever. If anybody's ever fought for the East Side and Casablanca Elementary Schools, it's this trustee from the day he walked onto this board 14 years ago. And you can shake your head at me, but go back and look, Sammy. I did it. Now, what's, what we seem to be forgotten here, too, is that in 2011, and Mr. Kinnear was principal then, but he's been silent on it, but I'm going to bring it out. We, we, North High School, got, I believe, 26 or 28 million under Measure B. Which one was it? 27 million. 27 million. Wait, I'm talking, not you. You got 27 million, but everybody seems to forget that. North High School didn't get anything. There was a vote, there was five board members on, sitting up here, two of them are left, Alavi and Hunt. We lost a vote that night to do a stadium at North. The other three members, Mr. Van de Zyl, principal, former Principal Beatty, and Mrs. Cloud were against doing a stadium at North. You remember that, Rich because you and I worked on it afterwards. The fact that, that Mr. Sergio San Martin's predecessor just decided since we didn't have the votes, he didn't bring the budget nor the parking count, which we knew that off-site off parking in industrial area like North, you can count it. We were able legally to bring it back, and then the North alumni, and including Joanna Hayes sitting right over there, four months pregnant or more than that, including many others of you, including uh, uh, Kathleen Barth, who led people, including behind the scenes and probably hurt his career, Dale Kinnear, organizing all of you, 
but you got the stadium and the college track and you got 28 million. So North has not been, as long as I've been on this board and I've fought for it, has not been denied. Yes, North needs 151 million, probably based on the escalation, they need more than that. And, and so do all of us. The, the study that was done before measure uh, O was, was forwarded said that this, that this district, this was in 2015-16, the district needed $1.3 billion. Riverside Unified, because of all the governmental property within our borders, can only bond about $392 million. So we can, we can bond about 25 cents on the dollar that we need. That 1.3 billion today would be about 2 billion we need. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, fellow citizens, we need more money. But that's all we have unless we go out for another bond. You can't use the money that is in reserve that was asked. We have money in reserve. Find the money. You, it's one of the things I learned coming on that I was amazed at Department of Education. Oh, there's so many different colors of money in public education. Probably should be. But you, for brick and mortar, you can use your bond money. Or, or your maintenance money, or sometimes your, as we did with the, uh, I think part of the field at North was from uh, redevelopment money. So North has not been denied. I'm the one that was confused last time. I thought 39 million, which is a 41% increase over the 26 million originally budgeted, 39 million plus the 11, what was the 50? So it's my mistake, don't, I know, it's my mistake on that, but here's what I need. I need you to help me explain. Take the word north out for a moment. How do I explain equity to the other high schools? How do I tell Arlington High School, who got $26 million, that north gets double that? How do I tell Polly, who got $26 million, that north got double of that? One more million at Arlington would have, would have been able to, who designed that school? But they, they have two separate administration buildings, two separate ones. Rich, you were in the administration. You know that's not the greatest way to do it and bring that together. One more million of all of that included. Instead of spending $650,000 to renovate a crummy pool, we could have had, we could have built a pool to take that money and added it to, including the admin building, $1 million, and we could have had a new pool like North got under Measure B, like North got under Measure B. So quit saying North didn't get anything. All right, Alavi and I went through hell with those other three members, but the North people came out and, and made sure it happened. All right, now, I just have to know how I'm going to say to other schools and the kind of precedent I'm setting that, that I'm sorry, but you didn't get it. I'm all, I'm all for giving North 39, 40 million over the 26 because of the escalation has been crazy. You've got to get off this 151 million because it's part of the 1.5, 1.2 billion dollars. Anyhow, yes, North, they built North and Poly at the same time. I, God knows why that board did it, but I can't go back and find that out. They opened them on the same day. They designed them differently, which I don't know why that was. And they designed both of them, if you remember, for 1,600 students. Today, this morning, there was at least 2,600 students at both of those campuses. So that's what we're up against. We're up against the history of inadequately designed, who didn't look at the growth of Riverside when they did their schools. But I can't, in all good conscience, give North double in, in measure O money. I'm fine with the ESSER money. My God, they, they, they needed it. Those air conditioners are old. We are told, Ms. Luna, that 11 will do it. If not, we'll do what we can do to find it elsewhere through redevelopment funds or something. And if, and if the bond passes, the state bond, then we will be able to get some money back. North doesn't. North spent a lot of its state contingency money under Measure B. Each, each school gets a bucket of money, so to speak. And King's about to get uh, 25 million because they're 25 years old. Uh, the other thing is the number one, as I've said to the folks that were against the mask and against the vaccinations and everything, who challenged that I took an oath, we checked it out. The oath of office that we take gives us the number one priority. Number one priority is to ensure safe and secure campuses. We're not doing the, the, the King parking lot is huge, and they didn't do any pathways through it. I imagine the north uh, parking lot there towards the back uh, doesn't have pathways that are safe. 
Why aren't we talking about that? But let's remember the bottom line, whether tonight's vote is to give North 40 million or 50 million, it's still gonna be up to this board to decide what are the priorities. I will tell you, both Poly and Arlington and North both said, oh, we want a big giant gym. I don't blame them a bit, but we can't afford big giant gyms unless we're gonna take all of it. So we did auxiliary gyms, which, when, how we finally came around this board, because Mrs. Allen and I used to debate about this, but she said it at that meeting uh, four years ago when we met at, uh, I believe it was Central Middle School's library. She said, no, you're right. The, is that a gymnasium is a classroom. And that's the only type of classroom you can't replace. Because gymnasiums are used more than sports. They're used for testing and everything. So it's still going to be up to the board to decide when, in whatever the number is and where we can find it and all, what's going to happen at John W. North. Because that's exactly what the board did at Arlington and at Poly. So, but I have to understand, and maybe you can help me, Dr. Farouk or Mr. Kinnear, you can help me how we explain equity to the other high schools that we are going to double the price of construction. I've checked this six different ways, and I mean that, is not doubled under the pandemic. It has gone up as we did with, with Casablanca. We increased Casablanca by 39%. I, I know we, we did because it's going to be farther down the line because it will take us all of 22 and maybe longer to buy all those properties on the east side. But how much is east side? Is it 56 million? I don't remember. Uh, $62 million. I'm sorry? The board allocated $62 million. $62 million to the east side, which, Ms. Tribble, is not going anywhere. And Ms. Escobar, it's not going anywhere. It's staying right where it is. It doesn't change anything. We're talking about north tonight and helping me understand as a trustee two things. One is how do I explain to the other schools and the voters and all of that, Rich, it's not your turn, buddy. You can talk to me afterwards. It's not your turn, Rich. How do we explain? Because Polly and North are the same age. Yes, I'm sure there was problems in the, in the 60s and all. I don't doubt that. I didn't get around to North until 76. I had the opportunity to coach there. But I don't doubt there was problems there. But since I've been on board, Ann Alavi's been here, we've made sure that North was never gotten anything less than, in fact, than, than Polly did. I think Polly got about a half a million more under B because of a 50-meter pool costs more than a stadium because you can buy the, the bleachers already made and that sort of thing. So it is not correct that North doesn't have anything. It is not correct we're taking everything away from North. But you've got to help me understand. If it wasn't North, if we were talking about any one of the other four comprehensive schools, Ms. Tribble, I'll talk to you later. If it wasn't any of those, Mr. Lee and fellow colleagues, how would we explain that? How would we say, well, we just want to give them double when the cost escalations do not justify double? I'm not talking about the 11 million again. I'm talking about 50 million, which, which is about 96%, if I do my math right in my head, uh, an increase. How do we justify a 96% increase over what the other schools got? I can justify at least a 40, maybe even a 50% increase, which I think 50 million is, uh, or 39 million is. 30, 39 million is 41%. But it, and I can do that because of the cost escalation, because of the pandemic, because of the stupid tariffs that were done by the former administration and others. But I cannot justify equity in, in this district, excuse me, I cannot justify equity in this district if, if, if by giving a 100% increase to one school, who I know thinks they didn't get anything, but you know, Dale, you and I were there, you were there for Measure B, they got their science building, and you got your stadium, and your, and your college nine-lane track, and a pool, and redid the tennis courts, if I recall, too. Didn't get to add the seating, didn't have the money, but, but we did those things. I remember that well. So I just have a hard time of explaining to the principals at the other schools, to the employees of the other schools, man, we're not having a discussion right now uh, of, of what it is. I know you don't agree with me. I know you forget that Alavi and I fought for the stadium, you, you, that we fought for, for an east side school, but we've got to be equitable. There's not money sitting around in a drawer somewhere. 
measure B, uh, measure O is it. And God hope the, the bond passes. So right. I cannot vote for the original motion. I'm sorry if I made a mistake. I thought I asked the correct question. This includes the 11 million, and, uh, which, and that meant I was thinking it was 39 million. But, and I'm not angry at North. My God, I'm, I fought for North and the East Side. And I can prove it. But, but you cannot tell me how do I, what do we say? What do we say to King where kids are having to walk through a parking lot without any sidewalks? What do we, what do we say to these schools? How do we do that when our number one job, colleagues, is to ensure safety? And, we, and our, our, everything we have talks about equity, and this would be inequitable. And I do not argue that North and Poly and other schools need a lot more than this community can give them. But as long as we have federal land, state land, uh, UCR, RCC, Sherman, CSDR, almost every building in the downtown area is owned by the city or the county or the feds, and we can't, we can't tax them. These new hotels will help. We'll probably be able to go up to $415 million or so. But that is the inequitable part of it. So I, I will not support, I'm sure it will pass, but I've got to be able to say something to Arlington and, and Ramona and and King and Polly and Lincoln as to why it is. And again, it has nothing to do with STEM. Nobody's taking any money away from an East Side school, an elementary school. I said that night, I wish we were voting on East Side school number two, and that's a challenge we gotta figure out. But you have to help me understand, Rich, at how I can justify double. Mr. So Hunt. we can talk about it during the break. Thank you, Mr. Lee. There's a few other people I want to speak, and then we can come back to you, sir, if yeah. you still got some more comments. And if uh, my, if my trust, fellow trustees can push that request to speak, because when too many of us turn our mics, there's some feedback. So I think I saw Mrs. Alavi's uh, mic light up first. So Mrs. Alavi and then Mr. Kinnear. Okay, thank you. Um, when the first uh, North plan came back from the committee to our operations board subcommittee, that Mr. Kinnear and I sit on, it was clear that what they were recommending for the amount of money was not, at least in my view, an equitable pro uh, project. In other words, the money wasn't going as far as it had for Arlington and for Polly. And at that point in time, we came back and we said that to you. We said, what we want is an equitable project. What we want is a project of equal equalness to what has already gone on at Arlington. And that's going to cost more money. Now, I didn't know, I, I don't know how much more that's going to cost, but I outlined at that time some of the things that were higher on our list. We don't have a plan yet. We have not seen a plan yet. But some of those things were to deal with um, totally redoing uh, from the ground up, all the science classrooms. It was to uh, doing something with the gym and the weight room. It was having some kind of entrance from uh, the back parking lot so that it was attractive to, to, to do the ADA upgrades, to do all those things. We do not know exactly what that's going to cost, but we know it's going to cost considerably more than what we budgeted. So. I think that the amount of money we came up with was almost a contingency in order to cover an equitable project. We, the, just because we save 50 million, we, we don't have to spend 50 million. I mean, maybe a project of the kind we're talking about will cost less than that. But how do we know until we actually see the plans? So for me, it's about equity of project scale. And I really want there to be a project that North feels is a comparable project. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Alvey. Mr. Kinnear? Thank, thanks, Mr. Lee. Yeah, Mr. Hunt, I'd, uh, I'd be happy to debate uh, the issue of North with you uh, publicly at any time. I'd like to, uh, to no, not now. Oh, uh, I'll be happy to do it, and I'll be happy to do it in, in private. My response to you, my response to you, how do you explain the issue of equity to the other high schools? 
let's walk together. Let's walk the campuses. That, that's how I explain it. I'll, I'll walk with you, with any principal, with any community member. Let's, let, let's drive up to King, take a look at what King looks like, and drive up to North, take a look at what North looks like, and let's see if it's equitable. Because it's not. I was at Arlington the other day, and Arlington deserves more, I know they do. But what I saw at Arlington transformed their campus, transformed it. Uh, and that's what I want to see at North. I want to see a transformation so that our community can, uh, can say all of our schools are schools that we're, uh, we're proud to send our, our kids to. And, and frankly, if we walk together, uh, I'm, I, I guess I'd like to debate, uh, uh, debate the, uh, how equitable schools are by walking the campus with, with you. And then we can come back and share it at a, at a board meeting. I'll do that with you. I'll do that with you tomorrow. Can I go? <laughs> uh, Mr. Farouk. Okay, uh, unless Trustee Lee wants to speak, I, I would just go back to putting the motion on, on the floor for consideration. Three million from the unaccounted, eight and a half million from the contingency funds from the original motion uh, to, to address this matter. I did tell Mr. Hunt I would come back to him one more time before we take the motion. Go ahead, Mr. Hunt. How does the, I, I didn't quite understand that. The, we have 11 million in ESSER funds. Where are we getting this? Where's the eight and the three now? Okay, in the, in the motion, three million of it was unaccounted for. It, we allocated 187 out of 190. So right. three million I'm drawing from the unaccounted amount. In the motion, I set up to $10 million of contingency funds. Basically, that would be at discretion. So we can just dedicate eight and a half million of that contingency specifically to North to address this. So without the 11, from Esser, how much is that dedicated to North? It would be it would be fifty million dollars total uh, of the Measure O funds plus the eleven and a half of the Esser funds. Yeah. Okay. I'm just not getting your eight, your eight, your three, but that's okay. With that, the eight and a half and three, because the the way that it was budgeted af after the meeting was that uh, it it wasn't taking into account that the amount of the fifty million we were saying was on top of the Esser. So the Esther is 11 and a half. That's where I'm coming up with three million from the unaccounted, eight and a half from the contingency, eight and a half plus three equals 11 and a half. That's, that was the amount. And it's a different the 11 than the Esther 11. It's on top of the Esther. Yeah. All right. All right. Thank, thank you for that explanation. Doctor, uh, doctor uh, Principal Trustee Kinnear, you and I worked hard on the other. I should mention, by the way, and I didn't, uh, that Mrs. Cloud became the third vote. The other two board members stay where they are. They thought we had uh, district stadiums or something like that. But it was Mrs. Cloud who gave us that third winning vote. Um, I'll walk them with you, Dale. I'll be glad to. But it isn't, when, you, when you're walking Arlington and Polly right now, that's, they're, they're done with their projects almost, right? They're 90% done. And you know, you look at Polly, and not a thing happened inside a building except for their new auxiliary gym. But there wasn't any classroom work done. Like, but because Polly was built on such a slope, everything went to the uh, uh, American Disabilities Act. We know that even looking at the science rooms at, at North, we have to be careful in what happens there because the American Disabilities Act will be triggered outside. I work out fine at this Nog's gym and ever. All right, please. And, and uh, Arlington, because they didn't have that kind of slope, it helped. But it, it's... Polly wanted, and Arlington wanted, their, their locker rooms are crap. All of them are. Apparently kids beat up locker rooms pretty bad over 20 years. And, but we didn't do those. So it's hard to explain, and I'm going to want you there with me, when Arlington parents and King parents and other parents, Polly say, hey, they got double because it looked bad. We have to be better than it looked. We can't just do a look test. We have to look into what is equitable and what is needed at, at North. And, and I want them to get all they can, but it's hard for me to justify when it comes to equitable distribution of the funds that the citizens gave us, that one school 
needing things, as they all do, gets double when, when the escalation of prices doesn't justify it. Because there's also schools that aren't going to get fed. What schools now that we're following the next group, what's the next group, Mr. San Martin? Uh, we have groups D and E. And who are in those groups? And by the way, on the east side, we also put a lot of funds into Longfellow, about two houses to expand that area so we don't have to have them going in there. We need to do more on the east side, I understand. Well, what's, uh, in what's, group, in yeah. group D, we have Bryant, Highland, Victoria, Washington, Shimawa Middle School, Gage School. In group E... Uh, that's good. Shimawa is 100 years old next year. You think they probably have some challenges? You think those other ones don't? Bryant? Bryant sits on three acres. They did get a library last time around. So what I'm saying is that it's not that I don't want North or just take the name out, any of them to have all they can have, but how do you explain giving double when the escalation in prices don't justify it and these other schools don't get anything? I, don't, I'm, I can't answer, ma'am, to you right now. They, do they have, yes, ma'am, they all have roaches. We live in Riverside. And, and uh, come on, modulars have roaches, don't. And, and that needs to be a problem addressed and I, you know, and all that, but, and, uh, but how do you it, explain that they got double what everyone else got and that these other schools down there, I had a debate with one of my colleagues a while back about Jefferson School having eight, it was six toilets for 700 kids. Now, they did get two more toilets out of the debate. But those, those, those elementary schools have a lot of challenges for little people, and, and some of them are indignified. And yes, we, I, North, and given, give me any other name. I understand King is only 24 years old, so it's, it's got a lot more going for it, and it was designed better. God knows why they designed Polly and North the way they did, but, uh, and separately as they did with chillers and all that. But, I just ha have to have you know, I'm, I support the east side. I've supported from the day I got here. I've supported north, but I can't support, with respect to my, my colleague, Dr. Farouk, very much. I, I can't support just giving them double when it isn't justified by the facts out there. So okay. that's thank the end of my comments. I call thank for you, his Mr. Rock. We, we do have a motion, um, and for ask for a second. Um, I'll just throw in a, a quick comment. Um, I, I don't think it's an excuse, but it's a reason why we're here tonight. Um, I think the intent of Dr. Farouk's motion was clear. Um, I think the second by Alavi was clear. Um, I, know, I knew what I was voting for on that night. Uh, I think the confusion was when the 50 million was proposed by Dr. Farouk and we were trying to do the quick math, we should have paused, made sure we accounted for the funds, um, and that's, that's why we're here tonight. Right, so I do, I do appreciate this being brought back up so it's clear um, so that the folks here tonight that spoke understand that this board, uh, what the priorities are based upon the, the vote that we're about to take. Um, and then these, these back and forth with the audience, I, let's, let's have those take place before and after the meeting but not during the meeting. Um, so we do have a motion. Uh, do we have a second on Dr. Farouk's motion? Which, to be clear, well, Ms. Hill, do you want to? I, I, I want to be very restate clear. The motion. And restate the motion. Let's restate the motion, and, please. And, and I want to emphasize again that uh, not only was uh, hopefully it was clear last time also, but that this uh, the funds that I'm referencing were from the existing motion. So this isn't some we're not just looking for money out of nowhere. This is from the existing. There was discretion and flexibility in the motion. So it would be three million from the unaccounted. And it would be eight and a half million from the contingency funds uh, that would be directed specifically to North's uh, measure of budget. And that motion that you're making, Dr. Farouk? That's on sense. North's budget. Help me out. North's budget is 26.8. Uh, so you're only no, allowed an 11. It's not 26.8. Okay. No, we've, know, we've made just, a. Okay, let me just, let me just make this clear. We made a $50 million commitment to North's measure of budget with the 11 and a half ESSER funds million for the HVAC on top of that. That's the, that's the top line commitment we made. In order to uh, address this discrepancy that, 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 was, that why this uh, agenda item is back, three million of the unaccounted and eight and a half million 
from the contingency funds towards north makes those commitments, funds fully funds those commitments. Uh, and when I'm talking about unaccounted, there was 187 out of 190 million from yeah. the motion that was made. There was 10 million from the contingency, so eight and a half million from the 10 million would be going towards this project. So I hope that that's very clear. And and, and North uh, would uh, the would be uh, the whatever the project scope ends up being, it would be uh, had the full discretion to use up to that amount, 50 million uh, with 11 and a half million HVAC. Uh, from ESSER funds contingency on top of that. So it, how much, just so I get it, right? <laughs> if it's Turn your 50 time. million plus the 11 in ESSER and... 11 and a half, yes. Okay, 11 and a half. Um, what, what did Tiffany said, pretty soon we're talking real money, may it hear me in there. Um, so how much, take the ESSER out, how much are we voting on to give to North? Well, it, it, right. the, the, the issue was, is that we needed, uh, because there was some confusion, I guess, with you regarding the 11 and a half mm -hmm. million, that it was, yes, sir. That, right, that the, it wasn't on top of the ESSER. So I'm, I'm funding that eight and a half, I'm the 11 and a half million right now on top of that, so to, to make that clear. So again, it's from the existing motion, three million from the unaccounted, eight and a half million from the contingency. Put up to 10 million of contingency in the original motion. That, that will give us the 11 and a half million that... Uh, uh, Is that equal 50? Yes, 50 million of Measure O funds with 11 and a half million ESSER funds on top of that. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. I just didn't agree with the 50, still don't. That's fine. But, I mean, it doesn't yeah, have to be a unanimous vote. No, that, that doesn't have to be. That's why we're... If it was, we wouldn't need five of us. Well, we do have so. a motion. Is everyone clear on the motion? <laughs> Staff is yeah. clear on the Thank motion? You. Thank you. Okay. All right, do we have a second? This is Alvi's second. Seconds. So we have a, a motion by Dr. Farouk and a, and a second by Mrs. Alvi. If the board could please vote. All right, I think everybody's voted. That votes, um, it does pass five to one uh, with uh, Mr. Hunt uh, voting no. All right, thank you for that. Um, All right, so let me find my place here. Now that we jumped around a little bit. Uh, all right, so then we're uh, G. I think we're on section G now. Um, so we're going to recess the public session of the regular Board of Education meeting and convene the Board of Directors of the Riverside Unified School District Financing Authority annual meeting. Uh, at this time, I will recess the public session of the regular RUSD Board of Education organizational meeting and convene the Board of Directors of the RUSD Financing Authority meeting. I will pass this item over to our Assistant Superintendent of Business Services, Ms. Erin Power, to take us through these items. Thank you, President Lee. You're welcome. So um, our first item will be to approve the minutes from the meetings on December 15th, 2020, June 17th, 2021, and October 21st, 2021. All motion to approve the meeting minutes from December 15th, 2020, June 17th, 2021, October 21, 2021. I'll second Dr. Farouk's motion. All right, thank you, Dr. Farouk. Thank you, Mr. Hunt. Board, please vote on approval of the minutes. We'll give Dr. Farouk a moment. All right. Thank you. Um, that motion passes. Thank okay. you, Ms. Powers. Next. The second item will be the annual election of officers for the financing authority. The chairman, vice chairman, and secretary usually align with the RUSD board president, vice president, and clerk. So that would be the chairman would be uh, Mr. Lee. The vice chairman would be, um, who's the, I'm sorry. Dr. Farouk. Dr. Farouk, thank you. And the secretary would be Mr. Kinnear. Um, also the executive director should be our superintendent, Ms. Hill, and I will be the chief financial officer. Would you approve the slate of officers as recommended? If so you can approve the. Lee, I would. I would. Should you push yours? Uh, I would uh, move to uh, uh, approve the, the board of uh, 
to call the board of directors, thank you, uh, has proposed that with the our president, proposes. vice president, our clerk serving as secretary, and then the other officers, as proposed by uh, okay. Bauer. Do you have a second? Second. Thank you, Mrs. Alvey. Um, let's please vote. All right. That okay. carries. I think that concludes, right? Yes, the next item would be H to adjourn the, that meeting. All right, so uh, at this time, I'll now adjourn the Board of Directors of the RESD Financing Authority meeting, and I will convene the Board of Directors of the Riverside Unified School District Facilities Corporation's annual meeting. I will again pass this item over to our Assistant Superintendent, Ms. Power. Yes, so item one for this meeting is to approve the minutes from the meetings on December 15th, 2020 and June 17th, 2021. Do I have a motion to approve from the board? So moved. Thank you, Mrs. Alvey. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Kinnear. Please vote. All right, that okay. motion carries. Thank you. Next item. Thank you. The next item is to con conduct the annual election of officers for the um, financing authority. The chairman, vice chairman, and secretary positions usually align with the RUSD board president, vice president, and clerk. So again, the chairman would be Mr. Lee, vice chairman would be Dr. Farouk, and the secretary would be Mr. Kinnear. I serve as the treasurer and the chief financial officer. Would you approve the slate of officers as recommended? Do I have a motion to approve the slate? Motion to approve. Dr. Farouk, second. have a second. Uh, I heard Ms. Alvey first, so please vote. That also passes unanimously. Thank you, Ms. Power. Um, so at this time, I'll adjourn, adjourn the board of directors of the RUSD facilities uh, corporation meeting, and I'll reconvene the public session of the Riverside Unified School District Board of Education organizational meeting. Uh, so thank you, uh, public, for bearing with us as we complete our annual responsibility to do that. Um, I will now pass it over to item J, district superintendent comments, followed by public input. So if anybody is wishing to speak on an item not on the agenda, please get a card in the back and turn it in. Uh, Thank you, President Lee. Since our November meeting, I've had the great pleasure of doing classroom visits at Riverside Virtual School, at Shamawa Middle School, and at Washington Elementary School. I'm very encouraged by the hard work that I see at every site, and I love watching our students and teachers interacting. I'd like to add a little bit to what student representative Sitlali said about Arlington. While they will always be the Southern Section CIF champs, and they will always be the first RUSD team to go to state competition, they also came away with a life win. Not only did they play well, but their team their, and their classmates represented themselves, their school, and the district really well. To my delight, even the hotel manager pulled me aside and he wanted to let me know what a pleasant experience it had been to have our team and parents on site. He uh, definitely made sure to give me examples of how that's not always true. Um, so along with the, the game win, they came away with a life win. In addition, this past few weeks, our heritage program was awarded a Golden Bell Award by the California School Boards Association. And it was a, a great night with um, Rochelle Knatzer was there to receive the award and a few people um, to get that um, Golden Bell from California School Boards Association. Uh, and then the last award I'd like to mention is uh, Teacher Her Heather Zaragoza has been named by the California League of Middle Schools as Teacher of the Year for their group. Heather teaches at Gage Middle School now. Uh, then uh, lastly, following the uh, event at, at uh, the teacher event at North High School, we held a special board meeting 
at the Riverside County of Office of Education on November 15th. At that meeting, I committed to provide an update during my comments at board meetings and still till such time as we have an advisory group established. Our group is beginning, but not fully established, so I'll give an update now. In the time in between, we have met with two tribal leaders and will meet with others. Additionally, this week, Native American leaders from across the state came together to meet with Assistant Superintendent Dr. Jacqueline Perez to share resources, experiences, and tools that can be used for internal policies and curriculum development. We have identified five areas of focus, establishing this lead group, reviewing and updating policies, defining professional development, reviewing curriculum and the materials that are associated with it, and the last area are actions within North High School itself. We've begun the policy work by considering a land acknowledgement practice. Uh, we have much to learn in that area and we'll take this suggestion to the lead group. The RUSD ta Equity Task Force that was established in 2017 continues to meet and provide input and accountability for upholding our equity definition. They will focus on the nine measures already outlined on board policy 0415, which is the equity policy. In the area of professional development, we have modified our educator effectiveness grant application. You'll hear a little bit about it tonight. Uh, we're looking at professional development in three segments, cultural competence, anti-bias, and experiential learning. For example, visiting uh, local resources and learning centers. One of the tribal leaders suggested some specific activities. In the area of curriculum, our instruction team has published before Thanksgiving uh, some content for respectful celebrations and uh, they have also published for winter celebration. In addition, a California native leader joined fourth grade classes at one of our elementary, elementary schools virtually as they were doing their uh, traditional unit on California peoples. We have also done some research on work done by other districts and we're making plans to revise our internal resource for third grade known as the orange book. It has an orange cover. We call it the orange book, but it's for um, local uh, resources in the area of Riverside. The Riverside County Office of Education has expressed interest in providing support for curriculum. Lastly, North High School is developing an equity team to focus on their own school-wide efforts reinforcing the student chosen themes of inclusivity and reconnecting, and they will make their own plan for professional development and will explore specific actions that both empower students and create a safe learning and teaching environment for all. That's my report, and I wish a happy holidays and break to everyone. Thank you, Superintendent Hill. Um, that concludes the superintendent comments, so we'll move on to public input. Uh, members of the public may provide comments on items of business to be transacted or discussed by the board, including topics that are not already listed on this evening's agenda. Uh, the board is limited to responses they may wish to offer on topics that have not been agendized, yet we can ask clarifying questions uh, as to a presenter's public comments. Um, Mr. Mr. Lee, we have uh, five speakers on three different topics. Okay, but they're all public, they're not on the agenda, They're right? not on the agenda. Okay, Thanks. perfect. All right, so um, we'll allow three minutes per speaker, and we'll start with Stacy R., followed by um, Lana, Anna, and then Natalie Brower. Good evening. There you go. Yep, it's on. Okay. Um, several weeks have gone by and several board meetings have gone by and we still have no resolution of the clips that Mr. Hunt said you were going to send to the state, uh, Jose Medina. I've asked so many times, I'm so tired of asking, like, what does it take? It seems the theme is like, you guys say you're going to do something and you don't do it, like the gentleman said over here earlier. like. I really want that done. This is the fourth time I've asked now, and I just don't understand why it's not done, because you don't care. But if 
somebody else comes to the board meeting and says things about the teacher at North, you guys get right on it. I'm gonna keep bringing this up because it's really a slap in the face to us parents. I just don't understand why it's not done. And did you guys even read the notes that were left at the district office from all the kids and the, t and the parents and teachers? And what did you do with those shoes and notes? I really would like an answer and I will follow up with an email. Hopefully I'll get an answer that way. Um, <clears throat> I just, I, we're not gonna do vaccine mandates and I'm gonna keep coming up here and saying it because it's unconstitutional. Um, you don't stick a needle in somebody's arm that doesn't want it, and I'm just gonna keep on and keep on. Um, one more thing I do wanna bring up is I can't get right what the rule is because Mr. Hunt says that he can't talk to anybody in the audience, but yet he constantly does. And then he also says that people can't turn around and talk to the audience like Mr. Hunter's tried to just kind of turn and he admonishes him right then and there. But yet somebody comes to the meeting and they turn around and they're like, power to the people. And he doesn't say a word. I want equity. If you're going to do it for one, do it for all. Thank you. Anna or Mana? Mana, M-A-N-A. -A. Nope. Oh, I'm sorry. It probably is Maria. Looks like M-A-N-A -A here, but it is Maria. Sorry, Maria. Make sure you turn your mic on so we can hear you. Pull that microphone down in front of you. Okay. So I would stand up Riverside, but I'm also a concerned parent of two boys that are still at King. So three things I want to talk about. The first one, I'm going to go real quick, the fight at King. We all know about what happened. Um, a supervisor was kicked, and it was all on video. Apparently, there are TikTok and snaps dedicated to these fights. I want to know, what can we do to get more um, police on campus, more and another RSO, I'm hearing there's only one between the schools up in Orange Crest. It's not enough. Right now it feels like King is two different schools, one with very aggressive students and other kids that are involved that have to eat in their classroom. I know my boys eat in their classroom every day for lunch because they don't want to go out there because there's fights all the time. So that's the other thing. So I think also the other important question to ask is why the student was on campus because there were many parents who called to complain about the student because apparently he was aggressive with another student, even pulling a knife. So I don't understand why he was allowed even back on campus. The other thing, uh, COVID protocol. So my boys were exposed a couple times. They play sports. Uh, they both tested negative. Yet they couldn't go back to their sport for 10 days. But they could go back to school and sit in a classroom with all the kids. I don't understand what the difference is. We keep changing the protocol. We've kept these kids out of sports. This is their lifeline right now. And having to stay away 10 days is a lot to a student. So I would like for us to think about that. I've asked the board, I've emailed. When I even went to the, the AD, I went to the, the district nurse, and I asked, and they all said their hands were tied. But we've elected you to speak up on behalf of our kids, and I haven't seen you do that. I don't want my kid to be back on 10 days, no um, extracurricular even when they're negative. I don't think that's right. Uh, the vaccine clinic should not be on campus. LAUSD is a perfect example. Kid got a shot because he got a slice of pizza. You are worried about lawsuits for not having this available, but if my kid came home and said they got uh, the shot, then the lawsuit would be from me to the school. So we're trying to force our kid, or trying to force parents to have this vax. And I know it's coming from the governor, but I, we need you guys to be our kids' voices. You were here because you, we, were, we elected you to do that. So I have a sophomore right now. We don't know what we're gonna do next year. We're waiting to see what RUSD does. But for now, we're looking at homeschooling. And I know a lot of our friends are doing the same thing. My senior college, we're looking at schools that don't vax. This is unbelievable, so please, be a voice for our kids. Please, we're trying to enforce a vax that um, now we need a booster. Thank you, Maria. 
Nat Natalie Brower, followed by Sandy R, followed by Aaron Sintek. Good evening. Um, I've come here and uh, I've spoken about four times. I was with um, a friend and a colleague and I was here to speak at one of the first times we talked about testing. I um, reached out to you, uh, Ms. Hill, in an email and I know that you got back to me. Um, I appreciate that I'm able to reach out to you like that and feel comfortable that way. I know when you were um, elected to this position, I know that um, a lot of people were very pleased with that. Um, so I just wanted to talk to you guys. I just wanted, I didn't want to sit here and read anything anymore and get out all my points. I was rushing to do it. I think everything's been stated. The things that I want to say is that I feel like our district can do better. And what I mean by that is I come from a history of my grandparents taught in this district. My parents went through elementary, middle, and high school and graduated from this district. I teach in this district. I'm a resource specialist, so I work with our special needs population. And I take great pride in teaching here. And I think all of our teachers do. So I just have to speak to what's going on. It's, it, what's going on with testing is already discriminatory to take two sets of people that have the same chance of taking on the virus and passing it on and say one is clean and one is not clean. And I'm just disheartened what I've seen in our kids. I see kids for over years and I see a difference in them. And I know everybody keeps saying, I know you guys have said, I'm just following the law. We can't do anything about it. Our hands are tied. I 100% agree it's a unique situation. I didn't like hearing all the time that this was unprecedented times, but they are. And I understand that. I'm just asking for you guys to be our voice and get unique about what we're doing instead of being passive and uncaring. That's how it feels. Because are you ready to look at me and fire me and say you're no longer needed here? I don't want you here anymore? Because California legislators are already trying to legislate this. Then exemptions are off the table. I, I promise you that a bunch of us that are not here tonight, obviously it's the holidays, there's so many of them. I know from a personal experience with family, they don't wanna do this. What are we gonna do with all the students, especially a special needs population? Obviously I'm speaking and advocating for them as a teacher, that's my job, I advocate for them. Their parents do as well. So I'm just asking for you guys to reach out I know that according to LA Times, LUA, LU, LAUSD lost 34,000 students and fired 500 teachers and are now pulling back. I caution you to not judge those that speak here as the only ones against this. There are numerous teachers and parents that will refuse. It's not a law right now, it's a mandate. But if we don't do something, we're gonna have to be reactive instead of proactive. I teach my students how to have all the tools that they need to be successful, please, Take aside thoughts and personal judgments and get creative on how we approach this and be our voice. That's all I'm asking. It's not easy, but I know that our district can do better. They always do. Thank you. <laughs> Ms. Brower, thank you. Sandy R. So I'm sure you're all familiar with the quote, characterize people by their actions and you'll never be fooled by their words. Keep this in mind as I review the Independent Citizens Bond Oversight Committee. So let's go over what we know. There were five openings for the committee. The deadline to apply was November 12th. Six applicants applied by the deadline per my record request. November 18th board meeting, Mr. Nelson presented and stated his term was done, but that he had reapplied. Mr. Hunt then commented that he did not want to lose good people from the committee and that he wanted to place on the agenda for the board to extend the current committee members for six months. The same night of the meeting, the district posted on their Facebook page that they were seeking additional applicants for the oversight committee. The district extended the deadline to December 17th. I then requested the district policies on candidate selections and was provided just the bylaws. The bylaws do not spell out any selection process for applicants to ensure due process protections. The bylaws leave the selection screening process strictly in the hands of the superintendent to make recommendations to the board. Other questionable items from the bylaws for the oversight committee include that a committee member can be removed for any reason. How is that independent? That any vacancies should be filled within 90 days and that the district will advertise the openings in the local newspaper. The press enterprise confirmed that no advertising was published. So, which was it, Mr. Hunt? because your words and your actions are not in line. 
If you wanted to keep the current committee members, why turn around and post for more applicants the same night? Could it be because you had to choose five out of six applicants that would end up either placing Mr. Jason Hunter or myself on the oversight committee? These bylaws do not provide independent oversight. How independent can a committee be if you can remove anyone for any reason? Spare us that we have nothing to hide when your actions prove otherwise. You have no selection process other than Ms. Hill will review and present to the board. What criteria is Ms. Hill looking for? No phone call, no interview, or any due process to confirm that we were even truly considered. The district needs to realize that if they don't allow for more independent oversight and transparency, the well will dry up. And these pet projects won't see completion. These very citizens that you treat as having no say in the matter will be the same citizens deciding if we vote for any new bond measures. With regards to STEM, the MOU with UCR regarding STEM expired June of 2020 and re remained expired until November of 2021 when I received my records request. Yet this board still saved slots for UCR professors' children and moved forward with the new STEM lottery guaranteeing 10 slots per, U for, for U per class for UCR professors with no agreement. The agreement that was previously existed did not spell out the number of slots, again, leaving it up to the district's discretion. Textbook review, the district is currently allowing... Re Thank you. Thank you, Ms. R. Erin Sintek. Good evening. Yeah, just push that. There you go. Good evening, and thank you for taking the time to listen to all our topics, matters, and concerns within our district. I apologize if my subject of concerns for the need of textbooks has previously been addressed. I understand that technology has developed and textbooks are seen as irrelevant in this millennium era. However, the frustration and stress that arises when trying to help my child with his studies, especially math, is exhausting and extremely stressful. I feel that relying on technology as a one-size-fits-all to teaching our children is debilitating, and we are doing them a huge injustice and disservice from not only the stress and strain on their eyes and brain, but they are losing the connection that are made with print. I am aware of the disadvantages of text, such as cost, publication, time, the internet is faster to complete assignments, and you can find information on the fly, so to speak. However, the advantages of print are, but not limited to the following. A collection of knowledge, concepts, and principles of selected topics. There are resources for both teachers and students. They provide structure for learning. And lastly, students make a physical connection with a book. I invite all of you to come to my house to try and understand and apply the concepts of linear equations and graphing in math or try and explain the effects of gene mutation on organisms in science using slides. My son and many others like him need a textbook in front of them for their reference and examples. I too need a textbook in front of me so I can better help him. Relying on the internet and sites such as Khan Academy and others are of no help. I also will gladly provide the bottles of wine you will need for during and after homework. Because <laughs> it's just, I know these board meetings are a platform for our voices to be heard. However, I really hope that all of you will take in consideration our feelings and concerns and not just blow them over because by law, you have to be present and hold these meetings. We are people too, we are fighting for our children. Be that change that you wanna see, do the right thing. Thank you. And if it's all right with you, Ms. Sintek, I'll make sure that Dr. Lewis gets your information so that maybe he can support some of the concerns that you have. All right? I have it here. I'll make sure I share it with Dr. Lewis. Dr. Lewis is right there. All right. Uh, last uh, speaker for public input, Mr. Jason Hunter. Good evening, Mr. Hunter. Push the, there you go. Jason Hunter, District 3, Tom. No longer Ward 1, District 3. I'm wearing my, my Polly Bears hat tonight. The, uh, so I'm getting with it, man. I'm getting used to these school board meetings. I'm going to be one of you soon. And so the, um, 
I was listening to the previous agenda item. I'm not going to talk about it, but I'm just going to lead in here. And I actually had a lot of sympathy for your comments, Mr. Hutton, right? Is that I think that uh, uh, certainly nothing against the North crowd. Good for them. Kudos on them that they come down and they advocate for their, their community. I think that's great. I'm all for that 100%. But sometimes I like to come down here and advocate for the other, you know, 75% of the community or 80% what it is that, that you know, when this, this fixed pot of money is divvied up or goes towards one entity, and there's less for the other existing schools, and we have a lot of problems at these other existing schools. Um, of course, I've been saying that since 2018 when I was appointed to the Independent Citizens Bond Oversight Committee, which turned out to be the friends and family plan of the board members. But the, the, uh, uh, the problem is what the, the measure o bait and switch did, right? Because we all should know now, everybody watching from home, Measure AOO was sold to fix the existing schools and immediately after it passed, the allocation all went to the new schools. And so what ended up happening is you, you kind of oversold and underdelivered because now there's not enough money to go around for all the existing schools because you dedicated it all to the, the new schools. That's the, that's the primary problem here is that you bait and switch the public. The board did outside of Mr. Kinnear, who just came to the board. And so what the district's done in return uh, and it continues, my guess is it's gonna to try to continue to stack that independent citizens bond oversight committee, is they, they've trotted out, you know, the board says it wasn't a bait and switch. The district staff says it's not a bait and switch. The attorneys say it's not a bait and switch. Special interests from around the, the, the community kind of come out and say, it's not a bait and switch. And I say, you know what? I heard the same trollop eight years ago when I was walked out of Riverside Public Utilities from the city of Riverside. And if you read the LA Times just last week, you see my former boss is going to jail for 10 years for misappropriation of public funds. And I hunted that guy for eight years. And if you think I'm not committed to exposing the frauds that you're perpetrating here, and I won't go at it for the next eight years, you don't know me very well. You need to stop the bait and switch you need to pass another bond. You can't do it by lying to the community about how you use this bond, these bond funds. It's not going to work. You're not going to get you what you want. You will be stopped, okay? And we need to go back to having honest and transparent and open government, not the back, back room, smoky room deals that, you, that dominate how actions are taken here by this board. Thank you, Mr. Hunter. All right, so that will conclude uh, public input. That will bring us to uh, item L, which is board member comments. Um, and I'll start with our student board member first. Would you care to go first, Jordan? I'm a part of a dress code committee that is working to collaborate uh, to revise the dress code in RUSD high schools. And I've also been working with my fellow student board members to revise the process in which student board members are elected. So those are the things that I've been working on right now. And commenting on all of the North um, support that we're getting here tonight and that we always do, I will say that as a North student who's been going there for the past four years, we notice what we don't have. We notice like when the toilets don't flush. We, know, we notice when there's car air conditioners at the top of portable classrooms so it doesn't get musty. Like, we notice what we don't have and we get used to it. So I will just say that it's something that it's a part of kind of like the identity of North of having less, and it's something that we really need to move forward on as a district. Thank you. Thank you, Jordan. Uh, Mr. Hunt. Thank you, Mr. Lee. Thank you, Gordon. Those are good comments and I, I think we all appreciate what the student Representatives have brought and will continue to bring, and uh, y'all are proving it very well. I, we all appreciate it. Um, just to respond to a couple things, I am writing to the governor. I, it will go out tomorrow, and my my claim to him, or not my claim, but my I urge him cl to clearly explain to the people of California, though most of you know it very darn well, that it is. It begins with him, it is amended by him, and God hope one day it's rescinded by him, all these mandates. But until he stands up, I'm still bothered by the man that wore the black t-shirt 
that said, gather the guns, and we know who he was, and claimed to be a father. How despicable is that? When, when a five years ago, we had a hostage situation here at this district where, where a man was killed. When just a month ago, two months, a month ago, Oxford High School had a shooting. We're related to Columbine, we're related to Sandy Hook, and that man bothers me and the rest of us. But until the governor decides to step forward and make that clear, it won't change some of you, I get that, but at least we'll be able to say, did you see the governor's report, all right? But I understand, and going to the, some of the leaders tonight, and my overall, is that we, public education in America, which is so important, so important, it's one of the foundational pillars of our society, something we've all agreed to share the cost of. Yes, we get, I think it's $10,700 per child, something like that. The special ed children can cost a quarter of a million. But we share that, so all children have the same opportunities. But you've heard parents, not just tonight, I appreciate the ones that came up here, um, the lady that offered to go to her house and others, but since we've begun in my a year ago and more, how stressful it is for all of them. How stressful it, that the fact that the, their kitchen table has been turned into a classroom. I'm very proud that we came back to campuses. We're the ones, the only ones that came back in the school year. But, you know, American business, global business has come back too, but they've changed their mode of operation. They've morphed with what they see as the future with this pandemic and how things are still going. But I don't believe, and I really was hoping that American education and RUSD in particular, at least I'm allowed to have a voice there, would begin to look at changing as well. If I may, and bear with me a minute, not the greatest on the internet, but I should put my glasses on. I read something the other day and then I wanted to do some more research. This comes from Forbes magazine. And uh, Fair Health analyzed data from over 32 billion private health care claim records, tracking month by month changes from January to November of 2020 compared to the same time frame in 2019. The most significant spikes were discovered early in the pandemic as the overall number of assurance claims, stay with me, is, is among young people ages 13 to 18. In March of April of 20, as a percentage of all medical claim procedures has nearly doubled compared to the prior year. Specifically, claims to overdoses among that age group jumped 119% in April 20 versus April 19, while claims for generalized anxiety and major depression disorders rose 94% and 84% respectively. Claims for intentional self-harm as a percentage of all medical group reports in ages 13 to 18, middle schoolers to high schoolers, increased 99.8% during that time frame. You know, my, my father, born in 1920, uh, he fought in World War II. He then, Korean conflict, and he was in Vietnam. And he also worked in Iran during the tough times. And he and his buddies, when I was around him, they never talked about it. I, I missed the Vietnam War at the end of the year of my junior year in high school, but knew a lot of friends. We know if we know Vietnam vets how tough it is. I've become close to a young man that went to Ramona grad, great kid. I've known since he was a little boy. He served three terms or three tours over in Afghanistan, et cetera. He won't talk to his wife about it, but for some reason he'll come over and maybe it's the wine or the beer. He'll talk to me about it. And he's He's very, PST is large. I think Superintendent Hill and colleagues that we need to rethink what we're doing. I mean, we're spending time on homework and other things. These young people are gonna have this stress the rest of their lives. As dad had dementia, was going out, he would see and talk to me about things in Iran and what was happening there and the terrorist he had to deal with. If we don't begin to address what this one mom was saying up here a little while ago, and we hear all the time, whether they're for vaccination or not doesn't matter. They are, all the kids are stressed, and I know we have well-being, Superintendent Hill, I know, proud to hear 
several of our student speakers tonight talk about that, particularly the young man from Martin Luther King High School. And I know they're working to help each other, but we really need to look at what a school district should be doing now when it comes to social and emotional, because we're teaching them math, but they're, they're, they're the angst they have inside. I knew a boy that when he was 12, I know a boy then he was 12, was on a Boy Scout camp out where there was a flash flood and two boys were swept away and one of them made it and the other one was buried. And that was me, the, the boy that, that I know. Found him, dug him up, tried to get him mouth to mouth. You know, I was, I was angst by that for many, many years into adulthood. If we don't begin to look at what we can do in a real serious and mandated way, working with everyone, our teachers and everyone. And Mrs. Allaby has brought this up, God bless her, so many times. What is the use of homework? What are we doing when we should be looking at how stable are our young people? And by the way, how stable are our, our employees? They're going through it too. We're all going through it. We've all, it was a year to the day that we lost Miss Smith and I lost my mother-in-law. You know, it, it's tough. And, but look, if I was 14 years old, what would that be like? You have young ones. You and your wife are phenomenal parents. You have a great support system. But I know they ask questions, too. And I just think that, Mr. Lee, during this year, I would hope, and I hope my colleagues, I hope, I urge that we, that we look at the mental and uh, social, emotional, and everything of our young people and do more. Cut out things we don't need right now or that, or that we can prioritize. Because I can't think of too many things that are more important than any worker here in a factory, let's just say. And they're having social, emotional, mental problems, et cetera, angst and, and depression, et cetera. They don't produce well. Can you imagine a young person, as this lady was talking about uh, a little while ago, about trying to learn? and uh, particularly over. So I, I hope we'll begin to look at a different business model. We have the opportunity brought on by this horrible, vicious, uncaring virus to, to change something that's been going on the same way for nearly 200 years in this district, 150. I do want to say I do support, though it didn't sound like it, but I, I really do want to, uh, I know Dale or Mr. Kinnear served on our Oversight Committee, thank you, and had great Im input there. They said last meeting, it's got to change. Isn't often that Jason and I agree on things. So I'm, I'm, well, either one of us is right or wrong. But we, we've got to fix the Oversight Committee, how it's done. And, um, uh, and because in many ways, we have to be careful because part of the job is they're watching us, or they're kind of looking at what we're doing, but we it's also the, the staff we have to, they have to be over. So I really want to make that a priority, and I do, I'm, I'm sure that the superintendent can move those items to a date that Mr. Kinnear will, will be here at the dais. And um, the letter will be going out to the governor from me, not from the board, from me, and I will ask the board to allow it to be posted. Lastly, on the Golden Bell, I just want to, you know, for school districts in California, there's 1,037 school districts in California. The Golden Bell is sort of their Oscars or Academy Award. 1,037, 19 Golden Bells were handed out. I'm not a trigonometry teacher, teacher, but I think that's less than 2%. So you have a fine district that even under all this, that program, by the way, who was designed originally by our former chief academic officer and now sits as our superintendent and then enacted by a wonderful woman, I hope you'll meet sometime, Rich Rochelle Knatzer. Uh, it, it was put together, and I think it was 120, 122 African-American youth who volunteered were able through that program to get their A to G requirements, which is, is the key to get into a UC or a Cal State, and that's a generational change. So I'm very proud of the district, and lastly, very proud of all of our John W. North High School and their amazing season in a, in a very, very tough division. Riverside Poly High School and Ramona 
enjoyed those games. And Arlington, the resiliency is starting out at 0-7 and making the state championship. That is, a, that is a lesson for all of us, that coach is to be, that teacher, excuse me, is, is to be commended. And next year at Lions Stadium. Thank you, Mr. Lee. Thank you, Mr. Hunt. Mrs. Alvey. Thank you. I, um, I hope that uh, we can reach out to the parent with the textbook problems. I had a similar problem when my daughter was a senior, except that we did, didn't have online learning then, and we kept getting little uh, handouts <laughs> instead of a textbook. It's, it's impossible, really, to imagine how hard it must be uh, to try for some children to try to learn everything online, so I hope we can reach out. Um, I just wanted to say happy holidays to everybody, but particularly to all of our employees, and um, they've been working so hard. Uh, most of our employees have had to really rethink what work means this year, changing their jobs sometimes, uh, doing other jobs at the last minute. I recognize that. I think we all do, that this year has been sort of above and beyond on, on the part of the employees. Uh, really thank the teachers, the classified, and also admi our administrative sa staff and cabinet. Thank you so much for everything, and I wish you a wonderful, happy holiday. Thank you, Mrs. Alvey. Uh, Mr. Kinnear. Thanks, President Lee. Uh, Mr. Hunt, I look forward to uh, walking our campuses with you. Maybe we can start tomorrow morning. I'd, l I'd love to do that so that I can explain how uh, we can talk about equity in all of our high schools. But, you know, football coaches and players are a rare group of people who love working on Thanksgiving Day and during the Thanksgiving vacation. To extend the, the season through the second week of December is even better for those coaches and players, an incredible accomplishment. Congratulations to Arlington uh, for their CIF Southern Section Championship. And congratulations for them competing in the California State title game. Uh, they represented uh, not only themselves, but Arlington High School and our school district with a real distinction. We're proud of them. However, I'd be remiss if I didn't acknowledge the hundreds, literally hundreds of folks who work tirelessly in support of a championship team, but they're not football coaches or players and they don't earn any press coverage or trophies or plaques. Throughout the season, and in Arlington's case during Thanksgiving vacation and beyond, so many others deserve credit. Pep, pep squads, cheer squads, dance squads, ticket sellers, ticket takers, spotters, those who film games and announce the games. There are volunteers who move the chains they clean the stands and they work concession stands to earn an extra dollar to help their kids and programs. There are administrators uh, who work those events, those on supervision duty and medical staff, and I know I'm leaving out others who support our championship programs and schools. But thank you to all of those people also. Last week, I visited all of the CTE and vocational programs at Ramona and Arlington, from classes with a focus on careers in healthcare, culinary, construction, media, and engineering. I saw great teaching and a level of student engagement which everyone should be proud of. I look forward to visiting all of our district CTE programs at all of our high schools. I also attended the Riverside City Council session on the RCTC's proposed transportation hub as they discussed the draft environmental impact report. To build and operate a 500 space parking lot adjacent to a community park and one block from the site of our new elementary school is wrong. I strongly disagree when I hear officials say, and I quote, the 500 space parking lot can be an asset to the community. In addition, I joined the virtual public hearing last night to provide input and reaction to RCTC's environmental Im impact report. Kudos to Assistant Superintendent San Martin 
and representatives of the East Side leadership groups. In his two minutes, Mr. San Martin spoke of our concern of the EIR's failure to address issues surrounding our future East Side neighborhood school. Great job, Mr. San Martin. Great job for East Side leadership. Uh, uh, you made a difference. I also, along with, with uh, Mrs. Alvey and, and all of our trustees, wish everyone a happy holiday. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kinnear. Uh, Dr. Farouk. Thank you, President Lee. I really just ha would echo the, the comments across the board from my fellow colleagues. Uh, and one point I would just emphasize, too, regarding Trustee Hans comments regarding the um, social emotional well-being. I believe the American Pediatrics Association nationally has also declared like an emergency regarding those issues um, with our young people. So um, I know our district is uh, doing everything they can with respect to these issues with these wellness centers that we're establishing at. I know at North is one of them in Ramona, I believe, and others. Uh, but obviously there's a lot more to be done. Um, kudos to all of the different groups that were mentioned, whether uh, Arlington's football team, the uh, Golden Bell, I mean, all of the great things that our district is doing. Uh, I also want to echo my appreciation for Mr. San Martin uh, regarding the uh, CEQA public comments that you're doing on behalf of the whole district uh, on, that, on that project, the RCTC project that Trustee Kinnear mentioned. It's very important for our voice to be heard, uh, and especially as it relates to our, our school site over there for the east side. Um, the only other thing I'll just say is, uh, you know, I, similar to Trustee Alvey, I just want to express my profound gratitude uh, again to our, our students, our, our parents, um, all of our employees, all of our 4,000 plus employees, again, for the extraordinary dedication, resiliency amongst all, all of these challenges that we're going through. Uh, it's very appreciated, and uh, I just want to say Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays and uh, just a heartfelt uh, appreciation to cherish uh, the time that you have with your loved ones uh, during these holidays. So uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Farouk. Um, yeah, just briefly, congrats to Arlington. Uh, such a fun story to follow. Uh, and um, just kudos to the leadership team at Arlington uh, and the parents for, for making the drive and committing to those students throughout that whole process. Um, and thank you, Mr. San Martin, for uh, being our voice at the table to give input on how that might impact uh, the East Side School. Um, and happy holidays and Merry Christmas to everyone. Uh, thanks to Jordan and her colleagues on the student board for their efforts to um, make our process to involve students even better. Uh, and all those, please, Jordan, thank, thank all the other students that, that participated in that on behalf of the board. Uh, it's good to hear from high schoolers this week as they finish up their finals that they have some finality this week and they don't have to carry some of that anxiety and uh, the concern for finals when they get back uh, from vacation. Um, so I'm sure all the students, especially the high school students, are looking forward to that break. So happy holidays to everybody, and I'll keep it short so we can move through this agenda. Mm -hmm. um, and I should also thank, thanks to our, our group report uh, leaders tonight, because you guys stayed a little bit longer than you probably expected. So thank you. Uh, so without further ado, we'll get to you. Um, so first, we'll hear from Mr. Bernie Holt, the president of CSEA. Uh, and I believe, Bernie, this is your last report as the president of, of your, your organization. Yes, it is. Good evening, President Lee, past President Hunt, and board members, and my RUSD family. Um, it's been an honor and a privilege to serve Chapter 506 and our Class 5 members. When I took over as president, we were still in Zoom meetings. We were still not on campus. We were still working from home. And um, slowly but surely, we all got back at the campuses. And it was not an easy task for any of us. Um, and um, I am proud of my classified members for the work that they they've done over this last year. And I am very thankful for 
Kylie, um, Robin, and Marcus in HR for helping me get through this year. Um, we've done a lot of hard work, and we got a lot of stuff done this year. And um, I, um, I appreciate that leadership that HR has given us, and we need that leadership. Um, we had our elections this past um, week, and uh, I want to present to you who I have a lot of faith in to take over and do just as good a job, if not better. Um, Joy Hurst, come up. She is not new to the board. She's been our past communications officer. She's been our past um, secretary, and now she's our elected chapter president. So um, I ask you to just reach out to her if you have any concerns and, um, and continue what you did when, when, while I was president. So um, I wanted to say Merry Christmas and Happy New Year to everyone here, to the board, to the cabinet members, to the, to the audience, to our teachers, to our classifieds, to our administrators. Um, this district is strong, and it's only because we're here together, and we are family. Any questions? That up for me. Anybody have any questions for Bernie? For any comments? Since his last one, Dr. Farouk. Thank you so much for your service. Just a man of great integrity, and uh, you always carried yourself and and uh, everyone you represent in our district with great uh, class. So thank you, and looking forward to you know, continuing our great work. Thank you. Mr. Hunt. Thank you, Mr. Lee. If I didn't know better, Bernie, I would have thought Dr. Rook stole my notes. You are a man of, of great character. You've been helpful to me in my 14 years here. You've helped me understand the classified, and you've always been a great shooter. You and I went to the Washington trip together, and uh, I was telling Bernie how you were so excited to go out and see D.C. the few hours they gave you, and it was raining, and you and your friends came in. It looked like you know, you're somebody dumped in the ocean, but you enjoyed it. I know the hard work that you do in, in, uh, for accounting for us. I believe payroll, is that right? I always get it wrong. Accounting, okay, yeah. But Joyce, I, I know you'll be someone that will work well with Ms. Ybarra and, and represent your union well. And I'm very excited that you're there and that, Bernie, you're sticking around as past president. And yes. I think Dine is still on there. So it will be a, a fine organization to work with us and help us move forward. We're going to have a good team. So Yes. And, um, I did mention to the boss over there in the budgets that um, she needs full-time release, but I'm just kidding. Uh, I don't want her to know that, but anyway, uh, thank you for uh, all your help, and uh, I appreciate it. Thank you, Bernie. And, and thank you, Joy, for, for standing up and uh, taking, taking the reins. We look forward to working with you. All right next from Riverside County PTA, or yeah, RC, RCPTA, we don't have uh, President Mobashir here this evening, but we do have Yogini. Uh, Bresla. Yes, Bresla. How are you? Good, Good to see you, you again. Thanks for being patient with us and for standing in for Dr. Mobashir. Good evening, uh, President Lee. Past President Hunt, esteemed board members, and Superintendent Hill. Um, as President Lee just said, my name is Yogini Braswell, and I'm here on behalf of Azim Mobasher um, uh, for Riverside Council PTA. This month's theme is Give the Gift of Membership, and I'm happy to report that we have over 3,900 PTA members. Around 30, I mean, I think the exact numbers is. 3,950 members. That's more than double than what we had last year. Um, thank you for all of who have joined PTA. Your membership is invaluable to achieve the goals of not only RCPTA, but the units, um, all the schools. They count on your support, and they really appreci we really appreciate it. 
And um, every unit now is on Totem, which is an online membership tool that anybody can join. And so we're proud of that. And finally, um, and if you haven't joined, join the PTA. <laughs> and finally, I want to uh, report, delighted to inform you that every unit now has an active board. And so we have been able to reach out to all of them and be able to get the, the, um, the members in place and the leadership in place. And so we're happy to inform you that. That's, uh, I'm done for now. <laughs> I want to wish you all a happy holidays and thank you for your service. I know it's not easy, but we want to go back to the theme, which is be uni uh, united, unified, right? So we're a team. Thank, thank you, you so much. All right, and then unfortunately our DLAC president was unable to be here this evening, so we'll look forward to hearing from them at a future meeting. So that'll conclude our district group reports and we'll move on to our committee reports from the Board of Education. Uh, and first we'll hear from uh, Mr. Hunt about the uh, governance and finance. I don't have my notes in front of me, sorry. sorry. I'll, I'll come back to you, how about that? Okay. Um, so we'll move on to number two. Uh, a report from Mrs. Alavi on uh, operations and facilities. Thank you. Um, four, four topics that we covered at our last operations meeting. The first is uh, we had a turf fields update. As you will re recall, we uh, okayed two updates to the Ramona and the Martin Luther King High School turf fields. Those uh, will be coming back to the board in February. And we should, by September 2022, have new fields. So that's all good news. Um, next, we heard a very uplifting transportation update about our bus system uh, by Ken Mueller and uh, William, or Jay as he is called, Burns, from, um, from uh, our bus team. And I just want to say, for, stu for student, I should say, and I just want to say it was, it was very uh, positive. First, because there's such a good working relationship between RUSD and uh, First Student, and they have done so much during COVID above and beyond and as far as accommodating the increased needs of the district and changing at the last minute and hiring new drivers and adjusting schedules and delivering laptops, and they've just, They've just really done a lot of extras. Um, they've even done meal deliveries to shelter locations for homeless children. They're delivering Christmas gifts and uh, all within COVID-19 safety guidelines. So what, what a great company to work for. And going forward, all the changes they're making, they're gonna add electronic tablets to buses to increase efficiency. They're going to move their yard from Colton to Franklin Avenue and Riverside, which is an enormous benefit. I had no idea that that small distance will make such a tremendous cost benefit to us to do that. Um, and one of the neat things is they're adding electric uh, vehicles to their bus line starting uh, this fall with some special education buses that are all electric. So that ought to be great too. Uh, anyway, couldn't have been uh, more positive. Uh, the next item we talked about, ha it was kind of hard to follow, I hope I'm explaining it correctly, but when there are certain projects, apparently, through the years, such as moving uh, portables or um, doing smaller jobs, I guess, there are certain things that fall through the cracks. And these uh, little things that fall through the cracks mean that the project does not close out. And when the project doesn't close out, the uh, state architect does not okay it. Now, we have a number of projects, not, not as many as we used to, thanks to the good work uh, from operations. We have a number of projects that are still outstanding with uh, the state architect because of these non-closeout items. And um, Mr. San Martin has been working on with his uh, staff to do all the little projects that have fallen through the cracks through the years. So uh, we talked for quite a bit about that. And finally, we talked about adding plaques to new buildings that we might have for Measure O. It turns out that we have never done that before. Uh, it has never been our practice to put a plaque on a new additional building on a pre-existing school. 
and um, Mr. Kinnear and I uh, discussed it, and we are not recommending that we add, we change that uh, policy at this time, and that we not add plaques. It's an expense, and it would be a change in the way we've done business in the past. Mr. Kinnear, would you like to add to that? You did a great job for not, not being certain that you were going to explain the uh, uh, uncertified projects uh, correctly. I, uh, I, I also uh, uh, commend our uh, operations office uh, and facilities office. Uh, they've, they've taken a, a two-pronged ap approach to, uh, to, to fixing this, uh, this problem, which, which uh, places a burden on the district with uh, potential new projects and also with personal liability for board members and, and, uh, and the district. That two-pronged process, uh, one, is hiring a consultant to help us uh, through this maze of, uh, of uh, paperwork uh, to certify old projects. And then the second prong is on all of our current projects, uh, we don't make final payment until all of the paperwork is cleared with, uh, with the uh, um, uh, with the state, um, so uh, it's it's good to hear that we're not only fixing things, uh, but we have a solution for uh, uh, for the future. So good work from uh, from them. Thanks, Mrs. Allaby. Any questions? Thank you, Operations and Facilities Committee. Yes. Um, Mr. Hunt, yes, sir. Governance and Finance. I believe this item is on our agenda. This, this item is on our agenda, so I'll, I'll quickly go. This Ms. Powers did a wonderful job of. Uh, Presenting to us, uh, I'll just give you the highlights, the 2021-22 uh, first interim report. Uh, the highlights she shared uh, since the 45-day budget report of August 2021, changes included an increase in projected district, district enrollment from 39,094 students to 39,653, which if I do my math is a little over 500. A decrease in the projected daily, I mean, scarps, excuse me, Average daily attendance, ADA, from 95.4 to 92%, and an increase in the projected unduplicated, uh, increase in unduplicated pupil percentage from 69.6 to 73.78. Congratulations to all our administrators. Ms. Powers, as I said, will, and Mr. Lisa will be presenting a first interim report at tonight's meeting. May I add just on the turf that uh, next year will be 10 years that the North Husky Stadium had their first game, and so it is time as well, because of course that's not just football, they use it for everything like all of them. That, that turf and all needs its 10 year replacement as well, and mainly for safety reasons. So I hope our committee, and I'm so glad our folks found the money for it, but we can't forget about them. All right. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Hunt. All right, so that concludes the committee report, so we'll move on to consent. Uh, all items listed on the consent calendar are considered by the board to be routine and will be enacted in one motion. There will be no discussion of these items prior to the time the board votes on the motion unless a member of the board uh, wishes to uh, a specific item to be removed from consent. Uh, so at this time, I'll ask our new board clerk if we have any cards submitted uh, regarding our consent. There are no public comments. Okay. Then, thank you, Mr. Kinnear. So at this time, I'll look for a motion. Jordan, would you like to make a motion? I motion to abstain from items 015 through 018. So otherwise, approve the consent items with the exception of 015 through 018. Is that correct? Yes. OK. And those items are uh, items that a student board member cannot vote on. So that is why we're excluding those. Do I'll I have second a that. second? Mrs. Alvey, thank you, Mrs. Alvey. So we have a, a motion and a second. Please vote. All right. I think there's one more. It's me that has to vote. All right. <laughs> there we go. That passes unanimously. So I'll look for a motion to approve items 015 through 018. I'll, I'll motion to approve 015 through 018. Thank you, Dr. Farouk. Second. Thank you, Mr. Hunt. Please vote. All right, that also passes with one abstention. Thank you, board. So that will take us to uh, P1. Uh, it is recommended that the Board of Education consider the approval of resolu resolution number 
2021-22-68 in support of Assembly Bill number 75, Kindergarten Community Colleges Public Education Facilities Bond Act of 2022. Uh, Ms. Hill. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Lee. Um, this, is, should you uh, choose to approve it, is a resolution in support of Assembly Bill 75, which would um, make a state bond possible in future years. Um, as we do our projects, we accrue eligibility on that state bond list, and we currently believe we have about $70 million in matching funds accrued for eligibility should there be a successful state bond. All right, thank you, Ms. Hill. Do we have any cards uh, from the public? N uh, no public comment. No public comment. All right, so I'll close public comment for this item and open it up for board member comments. Dr. Farouk. I'll just make one comment that I've heard. Obviously, I'm supportive of this and it's sorely needed, but um, I, I think it's Assemblymember Ting is looking at, there's a historic surplus in the state legislature budget that maybe some of that could also go towards school facilities as well. So I'm hopeful that that uh, could be another avenue beyond this bond, uh, but I would motion to approve this. Thank you, Dr. Farouk. Any further discussion? If not, I'll take a second. Second. Thank you, Mr. Hunt. So we have a motion and a second to approve um, a resolution in support of Assembly Bill 75. Please vote. We got two more folks, one more folks, one more need to vote. All right, that passes. Thank you. And uh, Mr. Hunt, if I may add a point of information to Dr. Farouk's point, we have been working with the um, County Office of Ed Policy Advisor to recommend that some of that surplus be placed into um, school district budgets for facilities, uh, especially because uh, TK is expanding um, and there's already a standing need. Thank you, Ms. Hill. Can I ask her a quick, quick question on that? Go ahead. Uh, thank you. Talk into your mic. Oh. Uh, Superintendent Hill, we, hopefully this all goes through and all that. How, how would you and your staff look to, where would you place these particular new group of children? How, how would you decide what campuses? I mean, I'm, I'm not asking you to just come to Longfellow, but I'm just, what, you, what, what do you think is the criteria of how you'd look at that? For the, the new TK yes, classes? Yes, ma'am. Uh, our first choice would be to continue with our um, attendance area boundaries and accommodate yes. the students there. So um, Mr. San Martin and his group will be looking to see what availability there is. Um, and they're already looking at what the projected enrollment is because it's staged by year. And then to, to do our best to handle the students at their neighborhood school. Thank, thank you, thank you. I look forward to hearing more about that. All right, so that takes us to um, item number two. Uh, it is recommended that the Board of Education approve the 2021-2022 first interim report and adopt a positive certification pursuant to Education Code 42131. Uh, and this is the same report that Mr. Hunt and I uh, heard from Ms. Power at our committee meeting uh, a couple weeks ago. So Ms. Power, welcome back to the podium. Thank you. Again, good evening, President. Lee and Superintendent Hill and board members. Uh, first of all, while the presentation is loading, I would like to um, give a shout out and thanks to our Director of Business Services, Ms. Yoka, and as well as our um, whole business services team for their work on this first interim report. Okay, so the first interim period is July 1st through October 31st, and we ask for um, the board to certify that we have a positive certification, meaning that we can meet our financial obligations this year as well as the next two years. At the first interim, as um, Mr. Hunt described earlier, we update our assumptions based on um, better information now that we've started the year. So 
our first um, assumption that we updated our, is our enrollment. We had projected 39,094, and our enrollment is closer to 39,653. So that's great for enrollment. Um, but at the same time, our average daily attendance is probably going to be lower than we had anticipated. Uh, usually our ADA is around 95.4%, but we're projecting 92% for this year as well as into next year. Um, due to the uncertainty surrounding COVID and quarantines and um, everything that's associated with that. Also, um, also as Mr. Hunt mentioned, we have our unduplicated pupil percentage. Um, it's a big increase from our projections of 69.63 at 73.87. And that's actually um, not certified yet, so that number could go up. Um, our unduplicated pupils just as a reminder, it's a little bit skewed on that slide. But they are our English learners, our foster youth students, and our low socioeconomic status students in an unduplicated count. So our unrestricted income increased from 452.6 million to 457.7 million. And that was really mostly a direct result of our unduplicated pupil percentage increasing. So we have received $4.2 million, or we will receive that much more this year because of that increase in that percentage. We also had $800,000 in a STRS um, refund that we budgeted for. In expenditures on the unrestricted fund, we increased by about $16 million from 369 to 385.6 million. This is the time of year where we budget for carryover from the prior year. So carryover is um, unspent or unearned revenue from the prior year that we will either earn or spend in the next year. So it is now budgeted as revenue in unrestricted of 6.1 million. We also accounted for, um, I'm sorry, expenditures. We also accounted for 5.6 million as a compensation adjustment, effective January, if you recall, that was approved. And then we also added the um, increased supplemental and concentration of 4.2 million to the expenditure budget. I'm sorry, my mask keeps falling down. In restricted income, we increased from 182 to 190 million. And again, budgeting carryover. And then we also adjusted our COVID response plans. So we still have the same amount of funding for COVID response, but we adjusted our multi-year plan. As you recall, um, the funds were able to spend them through 2024. So we made some adjustments to the plans. And then we also received some new multi-year grants shown there. Uh, the largest was the Educator Effectiveness Block Grant for almost nine million. And um, Dr. Perez will bring that for approval, that plan later this evening. In expenditures, we actually reduced our restricted expenditures from 266 million to 260. But that was a net, uh, net impact that was the decrease because we did increase for budget and carryover of 19 million, but then we reduced our COVID spending this year and increased it in the two subsequent years. So we decreased 16.7 million for COVID response funds, and then we also decreased the expanded learning opportunities program by 10.8 million. We will spend that in the, in the next couple of years. So this is just to show you an updated, you've seen this slide before, but it's an updated um, summary of how we plan on spending the COVID response funds. And so you can see um, budgeted in 21-22 is quite a bit less than it was before, and now it's increased in the other years. So then we have our fund balance for our total general fund. We started with 126.9 million, and we have a bit of a surplus this year between the two funds, or the two uh, unrestricted and restricted, to end with a projected 129.5 million. And I'll go over the categories next. 
So non-spendable since the 45-day budget stayed the same at 245,000. Restricted uh, decreased from 65.6 to 45.5. You can see um, a lot of these on the, on the screen are very much the same. We did have a change in the expanded learning opportunities grant. How much is in that um, fund balance? And that was just due to actually taking it out of the fund balance and making it an expenditure instead. The biggest change here is the ESSER. Um, I don't know if you remember, but I told you last time about the changing in classification between fund balance grant versus unearned revenue grant. So that's what that is. Um, it was a fund balance grant, so we had it in our fund balance. It was 39.5 million in there. And now it's unearned revenue, which means we can't recognize it until we spend it. We still have the funds, we, they're just not in our fund balance. And then the other grants we added to our fund balance. So again, the Expanded Learning Opportunities Program, nine million, we'll spend it in the next couple of years, and so on. In the assigned fund balance, um, this is where we budgeted a lot of the carryover from. So you can see examples, site funds, donations, discretionary, we had set aside 2.6 million, and now it's zero. That's because we put it back up into the expenditure budget for the sites to spend this year. Also uh, to note on this slide is the textbooks. Um, we worked with curriculum and instruction on a plan to fund textbooks over the next 10 years. And part of that plan is setting aside $2.5 million per year. So we have done that uh, in this year. And so you can see the 2.5 million there. In committed, it's very close to the same. Our reserve for economic uncertainties um, went up a little bit because it's 4% of our total expenditures. And then our reserves for deficit spending went down because we added the compensation adjustment. And then this is a look at our other funds. So um, these are all projections for our other funds. But um, to note here is the building fund, that's measure O. We started with 113 million and we're projecting to spend 77.7 .7, uh, with 36.9 left at the end of the year. And then our multi-year projections, this is total general fund. Um, so you can see the surplus in the um, in the 21-22 first interim year. And you can also see that um, compared to the 45-day budget, we actually started with a much lower beginning balance than, than we had at the 45-day budget, 158.9, 126.9. And that, again, is due to the ESSER funds being taken out of the fund balance. In unrestricted, I'm, I apologize, the slide looks like that. But in unrestricted, um, you can see that we have a small surplus this year, 1.7 million, and we're projecting to end the year with 84.1 million as compared to 92.8 at the 45-day budget. Um, and we will spend down those funds over the next couple of years with next year being a pretty large deficit of 18.8 million. And that is due to the ADA cliff that I'm sure you've heard about where 21-22 um, and 2021, we were funded on 1920 ADA, but next year, uh, unless something changes at the state level, we will be funded on the current year ADA. And as you saw, we're projecting the 92%, so we'll see that decline. And then in restricted, we also have a surplus this year, a small one projected, where, where we'll end with 45.5 million, and then we'll spend down those funds, COVID, expanded learning opportunities, and so on. And we plan on ending 23-24 with 21.5 million, million. So as you can see from the multi-year projection, we will meet our financial obligations for the next three years. So we ask for a positive certification. Thank you, Ms. Powers. 
Uh, before I open it up to the board for any questions or comments, do we have any cards for public input? No input. No input, okay. All right, so I'll open it up to the board for any comments. Uh, Dr. Farouk and then Ms. Alavi. Thank you, President Lee. Great job, as always, Ms. Power, uh, your thoughtful analysis and perspectives on all this. Uh, my only comment is, and again, I think it's important for the public to know, the reason that we deficit spending is because as a public institution, we have to be putting the money back out for the use of what a school district's are and we can't just sit on on cash and so we're actually in a very strong position the fact that we have to pay down we actually have doubled the reserve requirement that other school districts of our size are required uh, that that's the basis of those things you affirm that yes uh, we are deficit spending but we do have the reserves to handle it and we actually do a five-year budget and we're we're fine for the next five years um, whereas a three-year budget is required by the county and state. Thank you. And my other comment is for Superintendent Hill. The ADA component uh, in the budget that you shared, to me, that's what really stands out. Uh, it, it's a very precipitous drop from 95 to 92 percent and the financial implications, but most importantly, the learning implications, right? I mean, if, if people, if kids are not in, in class, that means they're not learning to the extent that they could be. And so this is, Obviously, as you indicated, Ms. Power, this is a reflection of the uh, protocols that we're following from the state with quarantining and COVID. It, it, it's being exacerbated from those conditions. It is not unique to, the, to our school district. So my comment to Superintendent Hill is that I hope that in our government platform and the uh, communications that we're having, the, we are making this a very central issue from a funding standpoint, because this is affecting a decline in uh, resources for school districts throughout the state given the unusual circumstances, but the nature of, of funding from a formulaic standpoint have, have not changed. And now we have that cliff coming up too. So I just wanted to make sure that that gets incorporated in the platform. Thank you. Ms. Alvey. Thank you. Um, just for the boards, um, I spoke to Ms. Power about this. Uh, I attended a budgeting, a budgeting seminar at the school board's conference, and they were recommending actually increasing that reserve to all districts to encompass at least one month of salary. And in our, our case, that would be a considerable amount. So I'm just pointing out that that was the recommendation from the CSBA. Um, can you tell me what the what exactly is the LCAP set aside? Because I'm not exactly sure. That is the um, amount that the board decided to set aside from what fell out of the LCAP plan as unspent dollars in a fashion where 40% was designated for textbooks, 30% for technology infrastructure, and 30% for technology devices. So why is it in an account called LCAP set aside and not put into those other areas? It's just displayed that way. It is actually in the budget in those other areas, it, in the fund balance. It just is in this report, is not. Right, it just dis, it's described as LCAP set aside just because that's how it's always been described. Okay. We can describe it differently if you'd like. Yeah, well, I'd put it where it was supposed to be, but thank you, that's all I have to ask. All right, thank you, thank you, Ms. Alvey. Uh, Mr. Kinnear. Push your, uh, turn on your microphone there, sir. I don't know what staff members were responsible for uh, working on the free and reduced lunch applications to increase uh, our uh, level of, of uh, uh, SES students, but Kudos to them. I, I don't know how uh, our district staff uh, can uh, accomplish such a feat in increasing those numbers in such a drastic way. So uh, pass that compliment on to, uh, to everybody. If I heard you correctly, uh, that increase in, in uh, uh, SES numbers accounts for a little less than $5 million added to our LCAP budget. Um, when will that be available to us? And when, or do we have a timeline as to 
uh, board involvement in determining the process for how to best use those funds? It becomes available now, this year. It's $4.2 million. It added to our supplemental and concentration funding. And so it'll go through the regular LCAP process uh, with, with Dr. Perez's um, department and team to determine how best to utilize those funds. So do we have a timeline for that or is... Uh, the I'm LCAP, uh, well, the LCAP supplement will be in February, but that is to discuss the 7.8 million that was added as a result of the increased concentration grant. And then the LCAP, when does the LCAP come uh, we begin uh, preliminarily um, in terms of what uh, we have scheduled into the board meetings uh, to begin discussions in April so that we do have set aside a couple of board meetings for the discussion of LCAP so we won't be spending that increase of 4.2 million dollars until next year or I mean I, I guess I'm confused as to as to how it works we'll we'll spend the money once we decide what the plan will be to spend the money yes and per the new state guidelines we have to carry those funds over for that purpose supplemental and concentration which is to increase or improve services with we can increase or improve the whole educational program but it has to be principally directed toward our unduplicated students. Yes. And so um, whenever the plan is done, the LCAP plan, that's when the funds will be spent. If they're not spent this year, they'll be carried over to be spent next year. Okay. Thank you. Um, can I ask a follow-up question to that? You may. We already have a plan. So why were we waiting for another plan, right? Why don't we use those funds right now for that purpose with the current plan we're now, we now have? Well, there are specific dollars allocated to each action in the plan. So the plan would have to be revised um, to add dollars to the plan. I can speak to that as well. So I think part of the, and, and maybe I'm wrong, but I'll speak a little bit more to this, is that every year, we have to reassess also the climate and the conditions and the priorities which shift, and not to mention that it, the LCAP is not just our, our board's determination, but the community input and the process that's involved in deliberation. So it's more of the fact that it's not a static thing. No, no, this is, right? this is money that was generated this year. This year, it's part of this year. So shouldn't it be, addri shouldn't it be addressed by this year's LCAP plan? I don't understand why we need to reassess where this money goes we could apply it directly to our to our lcap for this year correct and, and it's this year's children shouldn't it benefit this year's children yeah. yes let me give you an example mrs allaby um <clears throat> well and now I'll, I'll start by going back to dr Perutz's um first comment when we make the lcap as you know we analyze our needs we choose some actions to meet those needs and then we fund the actions. We never can fund all the actions we wanted to. So there's always a you know, desirable next list. One specific example that we have been talking about in cabinet to bring to the board about the use of the additional money is with um, our support for the MTSS plan by having the additional staff counselors, additional psychologists, and the teams working, we paid for that out of ESSER dollars, which is short-term dollars. So now that we know that we have uh, ongoing dollars, that's one consideration we might want to bring to then we'd be able to fund it ongoing. Um, so that's just one example of why we would rethink and not just go directly to what was in the LCAP plan because we also have the ESSER, the ELO, and all our many plans. Then lastly, Mr. Kinnear, to your point, um, the board will see the plans, but um, when, when the board has expressed a desire to fund certain things, we keep track of it and talk about it in cabinet. One example in your case is when talking about the deferred maintenance. Now, it wasn't a bunch that we put there, but we kind of keep a, I jokingly call it my, our worry list that we have. So we have a worry list 
of things that express desires um, or needs um, of the team so that as funds become available, we talk about the pros and cons of what should be funded ongoing, one time, that sort of thing. I'm sorry, I'm following this up again. But these dollars have to be spent in a specific way. These are dollars that are generated that have to be spent with our foster youth and our, our underserved communities. So we couldn't use it for deferred maintenance. Is that right? Uh, those dollars we've been talking about, the MTSS plan. Okay. Yeah. I just wanted to clarify. And I'll just also add, uh, we will be providing a presentation in February um, that we are required to submit a plan and also present here, not for approval, but just present and we'd be able to gather more input. Um, I also want to reiterate our um, um, stakeholder feedback. We meet with our LCAP advisory. We provide updates. We're looking at the data um, as we're coming in. We have a lot more uh, student data this year than we did last year. Uh, so we're also incorporating that so we're able to make informed decisions with the dollars. Thank you. Just a couple of things for me. Both of them have been mentioned, but just to reemphasize um, regarding regarding the ADA issue and, and the potential uh, cliff that's going to potentially hit us next year. And as Dr. Farouk alluded to, this is a problem statewide. Um, so anything that we can do to advocate uh, the state to maybe reconsider uh, using last year's numbers and maybe a previous year's numbers, because we know those students are going to Come, we're going to have a higher ADA next year uh, because of hopefully less quarantines and, and other measures that have impacted our ADA number. And then my my second, uh, Doctor or Mr. Kinnear mentioned about <clears throat> unduplicated count. So I know this was a big concern that we had because of the, uh, the there's no longer the need to complete the free and reduced lunch application because every kid can eat lunch or breakfast for free now. Um, and so can you just share a little bit about that process and on, on, on why we had those numbers and if we expect them to be sustaining if the plan is to allocate some of those dollars uh, as ongoing? Yes, um, to your first comment, um, our lobbyists do, are very much aware and are lobbying for some kind of relief at the state level for our ADA um, issue. It is statewide. Um, to your second point, um, yes, although our team worked extremely hard calling every family, um, we did have the ability to use the school funding form instead of the meal application this year as in last year. So it's an easier form to fill out, um, less, less information is required, it can be filled out by phone. So that means that our percentage went up and is more reflective of, of our actual population. However, with universal meals, uh, coming, which is amazing because it's free meals for all, the incentive to fill out the, the application next year might be minimized. Um, in that case, we could see a decline in our percentage, which is why we didn't project a higher percentage over the next few years, because we can't guarantee that we'll be able to capture those students. Um, Again, the lobbyists are aware of this. I've talked to Kevin Gordon specifically about this issue. And so I hope to see some kind of change or relief at the state level as well. Okay. Yeah, so I just second that. I, I think that it's important that um, we get an accurate count of actually the students that need these dollars. I mean, these dollars are available for, for these students. And if we don't have an accurate count, it doesn't mean the kids still don't need the support. So I think advocating with, with our lobbyists and anything that we can do as a board um, to, to maybe allow the, uh, allow us as districts to continue the same process uh, on the form that's a little bit more accessible uh, to give us a more accurate count, I think would be the way to go moving forward. Uh, if the, Dr. Farouk, you make a motion? Yeah, I'll make a motion to approve the 2021-22 first interim report and adopt positive certification. Thank you, Dr. Farouk. Do I have a second? I'll second that with commendation to our staff as echoing uh, Mr. Kinnear's comments. Thank you, uh, Dr. Fruit. Thank you, Mr. Hunt. Board, please vote. There's one more that's non-voting. Oh, Jordan's gone. Okay. That passes unanimously. Thank you, Board. Um, the next item on our agenda is uh, number three, 
Uh, it is recommended that the Board of Education conduct the second reading of the title of ordinance number 2021-22-02 by waiving the reading of such ordinance in its entirety and read only the title ordinance number 2021-22-02 levying special taxes on taxable property and community facilities district number 19 and adopt, and, and adopt such ordinance following the second reading. Mr. San Martin, thanks uh, for Good evening, giving President us a direction Lee. on this. Thank Good you, evening. board members, uh, Superintendent Hill. Uh, this is a follow-up item from the November 18 board meeting where the board um, conducted a public hearing and also approved the proceedings for CFD 19 or Community Facilities District 19. This, this will bring a closure to that, those proceedings which will allow and authorize the district to levy special taxes for the 2022-2023 uh, fiscal year. Thank you, sir. Uh, do we have any comment cards? No public comment. All right, no public comments. We'll close public comment. Um, and I'll open up to the board if there's any comments. I see uh, Dr. Farouk. Yeah, I'll motion to conduct the second reading of the title of ordinance 21-22-20. 2002 by waiving the reading of ordinance and reading the only title as motion. As we got it. We got it. Staff Martin. recommendation. Okay. Um, Mr. Hunt? I would second that, um, Dr. Farouk's uh, appropriate motion. Thank you. Sir. Mr. Kinnear, I saw you. Were you just going to second? Okay. Perfect. Please vote. All right. That carries 5 0. Thank you, board. Uh, that moves us to item number four. Uh, it is recommended that the Board of Education approve the Educator Effectiveness Block Grant Plan. Uh, and presenting on this item is doc Dr. Jacqueline Perez. And Mr. Dunlap. <laughs> uh, good evening, President Lee, Superintendent Hill, and board members. Uh, this presentation is a follow-up to last board meeting's presentation, and we are seeking approval of the Educator Effectiveness Block Grant. Um, again, these dollars, <clears throat> 8.7, are allocated to support uh, professional development in high-need topics uh, that can be spent over a five-year period. As we shared last board meeting, uh, our two areas of focus are to um, support practices to create a positive school environment with equitable representation and ethnic studies. Uh, the new piece of, of information, and we appreciate your feedback, is uh, our plan is to convene a diver diverse group of stakeholders or partners to discuss the specifics of the professional learning, what it is, how it's going to be delivered, and when. Uh, the advisory group, similar to how we uh, pulled action teams for COVID planning, uh, will work through the plan, and really we would be coming back in the springtime to share that with you. So as you can see, the advisory group is going to be largely staff as those dollars are directed to uh, certificated and classified staff. Um, but this advisory group, we believe, does represent the diverse perspectives um, in addition to uh, some community partners and um, individuals on the equity task force who've had four or five years experience of doing this and supporting our USD in the efforts. We will then use the rest of this school year uh, to plan for implementation in 22-23. So our next steps um, pursuant to requesting approval of this plan are to convene, um, uh, gather the members of the advisory group, plan the details of what and how the dollars will be used, and come back with an update in the spring, again for implementation in the fall. So that concludes our presentation, and we seek approval of our plan. Thank you, Dr. Perez. Um, Mr. Kinnear, do you have any comment cards? Yes, I see we one have there. one comment. Perfect. All right. Sandy R., you have three minutes. It's just concerning that we keep seeing the parent advi the advisory groups not including parents. I didn't see parents, I saw PTA. Um, I've had this conversation with Dr. Lewis before about not reaching out to parents and the community as a whole. I'm not finding out from PTA that there are these advisory committees. I see it if you occasionally put it on your Facebook page. 
We want to join. We want to be aware. We realized with COVID and everything that we have been complacent and apathetic and have not been paying attention to what our kids are learning, and that's going to change. So we want to know about these committees. We want to know about these advisories. And the fact that you're not reaching out to parents and you're not reaching out to the community at large is a problem. I saw that, that advisory panel list that she listed. Not one did it state that there were parents. It's an echo chamber of teachers and administrators, and you're not reaching out to the community as a whole. It needs to change. All right, thank you. That concludes public comment. Uh, members of the board, do you have any questions or comments for Dr. Perez? All right, seeing none, is there a motion? Ms. Alvey. Thank you. Um, I will point out to the speaker that this is professional development for teachers. So I will go ahead and make a motion that we approve the block grant. Thank you. We have a motion. We have a second. Second. Thank you, Dr. Farouk. Um, we have a motion and a second. Please vote. All right, that passes 5 0. Thank you, Dr. Perez. Thank you, Mr. Dunlap. Item number five is recommended the Board of Education approve the request for a variable term waiver, uh, Education Code 44252B, CBEST waiver for the, the teacher named in this item. Ms. Yabara. Yes, good evening, President Lee, Superintendent Hill, members of the board. I come to you tonight requesting that you take action, to rec that we are recommending the board take action to approve the request for the variable term waiver. Again, as noted, it is for 44252B for the CBEST waiver for a teacher named in this action in the subject area of foreign language for Spanish. Thank you, Mrs. Yubara. Uh, do you have any questions from the board for Ms. Yubara? If not, I'll entertain a motion. Ms. Alvey? There's no way no public comment. No, sorry, no public comment. I was going to make a motion that we approve the variable term waiver. Okay, Mr. Hunt? I would, I would second that, Mr. Lee. Thank okay. you. Um, just a reminder to the board if you push your request, I can see it better rather than you just pushing. All right, please vote. All right, that passes. Um, we already completed item number six. Um, so I think that concludes um, the, the action item. So now we move on to Q. Um, so Q2, which is the Board of Education will be provided with an update on ethnic studies in high school. And I believe Dr. Lewis, there you are, uh, will take the lead on this. And I know you have some support from Dr. Angulo and that whole team. There's a very large team sitting behind me and really appreciate, we'll recognize them in just a few moments. So good evening, President Lee, Superintendent Hill, members of the board. Tonight we bring to you in a presentation a uh, update on the work that has happened over roughly the last year to year and a half. And this was started with the work of our board passing our resolution with ethnic studies. I'm very proud of what that team has done coming forward. So it'll start with our advisory committee working with the support of UCR this was the adoption that we borrowed from UCR with their permission to help guide our work in ethnic studies. And you will see throughout the presentation, it is themed around the four groups represented in ethnic studies and bringing the stories, bringing the contributions, and bringing the work forward as we increased our both ethnic studies and our social science coursework. So I'll start back in September of 2020, the board adopted a resolution. Seven key points are noted on the slide, six of which the work has already been started. One, the last, the timeline working on TK6, uh, that is on a horizon, but we're gonna work through the secondary components first. And then as we progress forward, we'll bring an update back to the board regarding elementary. But you'll see that we've strengthened our offerings. I'll be speaking about that this evening. Talking about the multicultural perspectives, you heard about our opportunities for professional learning and how that will be integrated in the block grant that Dr. Perez was just speaking about. Our committees and work groups have been hard at work over the past year and we'll bring some updates forward. And then lastly, a supplemental material adoption process. I'll also speak to that this evening. So it started with stakeholder engagement. 
as we have followed the process, starting with our advisory committee, I will speak to that in just a few moments, that leading into teacher work groups, those in the classroom, practitioners that have been writing coursework, teaching coursework, providing that input, transitioning to different student groups, different parent groups, as well as different community groups. Finally, bringing recommendations back to the district and our update this evening for the Board of Education. So the dedicated advisory groups, some of uh, those members are here this evening, are laid out, and I just wanna thank them for their seven to eight meetings over the last 12 to 16 months that have been dedicated to giving input, letting us go out and talking to our constituents, our students, our teachers, our community, bringing back to the advisory, and that going back and forth until leading till this evening. So you'll notice it starts off with our parent representation, higher education, and then our staff. If you are part of that group, could you just give a, a quick hand wave, and I'd like to give them a quick round of applause for all their work in helping leading this effort. Thank you very much. Appreciate you all. And I'd be remiss if I didn't say uh, our uh, Carolyn Power was also helping lead this work from the beginning. So thank you for your work, Carolyn. We can clap for Carolyn, too. Go ahead. So that takes us to our next slides. Throughout this process, there were some changes, as with many things that we do. So uh, our board led the work with our resolution passed back in September, which started our grad requirement. This was the foresight knowing um, we were going to head down this because it was the right thing for students, the right thing for our district, and how do we build that process, and then ulti ultimately strengthening our coursework. And then there were dates that were set forward in that resolution, and I'm proud to bring back tonight that we are accomplishing those tasks laid out. In the meantime, we had AB 101 that was also passed. This mandates in the state of California for the class of 30, or 2030, not 3030, 2030, that they have a one semester course of ethnic studies for graduation requirement. Our district is proud to report we are gonna move that requirement up two years to the class of 2028, which meets the guidance of our resolution to help us be prepared for that. And we'll talk about that in just a moment. So the actions, we'll start with social science. So part of the adoption was strengthening our social science curriculum and also providing supports to teachers. So you'll be learning more in February between now and then about our materials adoption for all of our social science coursework, as well as bringing additional perspectives and supplemental resources into those four groups that we talked about into our social science coursework. And then last, that professional development for teachers, not only on the new materials that we are adopting, but also in the process of how we have our scope and sequence, how we talk about different groups of students, and how we can bring those contributions of those four groups into our classroom. A lot of this work will be supported by both our staff, but also the publisher staff that will be coming out when we have the different adoptions that you'll hear more about in February as we train on those instructional materials. The next thing this evening we'll talk about is our three-year plan for the development of ethnic studies. This has been a strength of Riverside. It has been a robust offerings of our teachers. We will be starting with a class of 28, that is the incoming freshman class of 24-25, where it will be a graduation requirement that during their span of high school, they will have one semester of ethnic studies before graduation. Our committees and work groups that have been teachers, students, uh, different district office staff, different parent groups have been working on that advisory group going back and forth of what's the best approach or what's the recommendation. And ultimately, we landed on choice for students. Our district has been known as a choice for students. We have been known for having robust course offerings, and we're looking forward to continue that and even expanding that to again focus on our four groups of students. What that looks like in this chart, you'll see, we have three current offerings. We have African American Studies, Chicano Studies, and Ethnic Diversity. Those are our three Ethnic Studies courses that we're teaching as current electives. We have our scope and sequence that are happening throughout our district uh, currently. You'll see that we will continue those, or we're planning to continue those for the 22-23 and also 23-24 school year, again with additional resources, uh, additional uh, support, but we'll continue those courses moving forward. When we hit 24-25, we have those three courses as the base of our ethnic studies offering to meet that ethnic studies requirement of our resolution for the class of 2028. Two courses you'll see on the bottom that as we talked about that feedback loop, we heard more and more about a study for Asian American or Pacific Islander studies and also native or indigenous studies. That's something during the 22-23 school year, we would like to keep exploring with our students and our staff. Do we have student interest across our district? Do we have staff interest to write coursework? If we find out that we have that interest and it's something that supports our community, then we will be bringing back to the board late 22 or early 23 when you do our typical course adoptions 
new courses for board consideration. That would be the fastest that would come back to you based on what we're finding. We may lengthen that timeline. We may recommend uh, more input. We'll be bringing more. Uh, we'll be bringing more feedback back to the board of board of education along that journey. What you'll then see on that timeline is 2324. If we were to bring that course forward and if it was approved, that would be the first year we would have two additional offerings of ethnic studies, leading us to the 24-25 school year. We could again at that quickest timeline have five different courses that would meet our ethnic studies requirement and our students would then have a choice of what course they would take to meet that requirement. Another way to look at that that we'll talk about across the bottom of our three existing courses is professional development. That support of supporting our teachers, we know we're going to have to train teachers, we know we will most likely have to bring teachers on board uh, with those resources, that will continue over the next three years. Refining coursework, adopting materials will also consider uh, continue all the way to the 24-25 graduation requirement that will all, all the way through and ongoing through the 28 graduation. For the two new courses, again, 22, 23 will continue to gather information and then teachers may or may not pursue writing the coursework. If they do, we'll continue to support that and that would come to the board for consideration. For 23, 24, that would be possible implementation along with professional development. We will monitor this along the way and provide updates uh, of our success. If it was to move forward, again, for the class of 28, would be available in 24, 25 for the first year of instruction. The last part is, how does this leave our district poised for the change? Number one, it allows us two years in advance to work with our staff, to provide the professional development, to hire the teachers necessary, and that forethought by the Board of Education to make sure we are prepared before that legislation of 2030. Another thing is professional development. We have professional development dollars that have been allocated. We have instructional materials that we are selecting, and that will just again give us extended time with our teachers to make sure that they are prepared for our students in the classroom. And then lastly, it provides us with that updated content and world-ready curriculum to represent our students. So next steps, we've talked about professional development quite a bit. The stakeholder input will continue. And the last is research and expanding our offerings. With AB 101, we know that with new legislation, many districts will engage in that dialogue. So as we continue, we will learn from each other, we'll have our collaboration groups, and we'll continue to work together to meet that requirement by our resolution of 2028, and AB 101 by uh, 2030. And that concludes the presentation. Thank you, Dr. Lewis. Thank you to the whole team that worked on this. Thank you to the members of the public that contributed to this. Um, we appreciate it, and then especially those that stayed here until uh, after, after 9 o'clock. Thank you. Um, so before I open it up to the, the board, do we have any comments from the public? We do? We have three public comments. All right, great. So um, Johnny Corina, Sandy R, and Shirley Tribble. So Mr. Corina, you can start us off. Good evening, sir. Hello. Um, good evening, everyone, all the members of the board, uh, Superintendent Hill, all of the parents and stakeholders, everybody here, uh, good evening. Um, I was one of the parents who was on the committee, um, and I like the way things are going. Um, I'm happy to be part of the committee. I wanted to come up here and show my support, and I feel like this is something that will unite our district, uh, learning about uh, other cultures and history from a, a, um, a different lens. We've all been seeing it uh, one way, um, and we all know relatability is big for the kids um, and the students so I feel like this is something they can relate to as well as um, you know students from heritage that weren't mentioned you know uh, that are non Chicano that are non African American non Pacific Islander um, we can learn a lot of things um, of how we helped each other in history that we don't already know like uh, for example the Tuskegee Airmen how many airmen that didn't look like them did they save and did they risk their lives for a lot of people don't know about that you know uh, Charles R. Drew, World War, World War II, how he um, came up with the first blood bank, uh, saved a lot of soldiers. Um, a lot of contributions that uh, African Americans have had to the country that aren't known, I feel like this will empower and um, maybe even uh, unify and dispel some of the conscious biasness that's going on, uh, not only with the students, but with the administration, the teachers, and even the community. 
Marco. Um, thank you again for your time. Um, uh, Carolyn, you've been doing a great job uh, helping out and kind of running the boat. Uh, Doc, uh, Renee Hill started it off, um, and she moved into her position as a superintendent, but she's still involved. I always see her there. And I want to thank everybody for their support. I know we're going to come across some um, pushback. So uh, hopefully, everybody can see the big picture and um, you know think outside of the lens. So uh, thank you for your time. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. So I did I was aware that the other one was a different topic, but I knew that they tied together. So in looking at the um, list that was provided, our district has 40,000 students, and yet you had five parents provide involvement. I understand you didn't want to reach out to the community as a whole because you didn't want you know 20,000 parents showing up, but five is insignificant um, to provide input on a topic that a lot of parents are concerned that this is critical race theory by another name. And I had asked for this presentation in August for you to reassure us that that wasn't it. And you know, we waited till now. It was presented the week before Christmas at what time? Close to the witching hour. Um, and that's why there's not a lot of people here. So I do think that if as a district you don't want the pushback, you should encourage the parental involvement. And I don't think you're doing that. I'm not against ethnic studies. I just want to know what lens you're going to present it through. Because I'm concerned, he, he's aware because he's part of the process. I wasn't part of the process. A lot of parents weren't part of the process. And I'm concerned what lens you're going to present it through because I have mixed race children. I want to make sure that, yeah, teach them about history. I'm fine with that. But I don't want it to be critical race theory because I have an issue with that, obviously, since I have mixed race children. So I just think you need to, before you roll this out, you need to make sure that you get much more community involvement and a much more detailed presentation so that people know what you're actually teaching our kids. We have a right to know what you're teaching our kids. I know that sometimes we feel the district acts like they know what's best for our children, but at the end of the day, we know what's best for our children. Thank you. Ms. Tribble, is she here or did she leave? She left, okay, all right. All right, that concludes public comment. Um, Dr. Farouk, let's start us off. Yeah, thank you, President uh, Lee. Uh, and I just wanna commend uh, Dr. Lewis, Superintendent Hill, the whole team, all of the people who have been serving, uh, volunteering their time, like the gentleman who spoke at, at, the, at the dais, uh, it's been a huge amount of effort involved in getting it to this point. So just really kudos to everyone. I just have uh, two comments. Uh, one is uh, regarding your exploration of the Native, Indigenous, and the Asian American. You had said that you're exploring and wanting to assess demand. My only uh, suggestion, and maybe you're already going to do this, is that I really hope we look at this more from a, a, a creative lens of how we can accommodate demand. So like, for example, I hope we're not just looking at it as like, okay, in each standalone high school, do we have enough to fill a classroom? If there's enough across the district, there's other ways for uh, the students that are interested across the district, whether it's virtually or whatever, I hope that we're making all those efforts to accommodate that because I just think even, uh, one, I want to make sure there's students that want to you know, study these issues, which I'm sure there are, that they have the opportunity to do that. But also I just think it's important as a district that the more we're offering that it's creating a higher level of consciousness and awareness for people, even if they weren't thinking that they were interested, to look up on it, read up on it. So is there some kind of effort to speak to that a little bit, please? I can, absolutely. Thank you, Dr. Furk. So two different ways have come up. And just to remind everybody, when we adopt a course, we adopt a course on behalf of the district. We have a course catalog that represents all of the schools that were there. One thing we're very excited about, and the team has, has talked about this as well as the work with uh, Steve Dunlap's division. So we have two different things. We have extended offerings that we offer through hybrid learning uh, that we currently have offerings. And we have our new Riverside Virtual School that we've expanded. So the exciting part will be is this will present opportunities for students where if we have five or six at a traditional comprehensive high school where we weren't able to offer a course 
due to low numbers, we do now have the ability and we're very excited to entertain the idea of pool, pooling those students from across our district and doing some type of hybrid or online course so we can meet that student request. So the team is working on that and we're very excited to have those opportunities. That's fantastic and a relief to hear. And I'll just, the, the last comment I'll just make is um, I appreciated that slide about the value of doing this early. Uh, <laughs> And I think um, you know there's going to be a huge run on ethnic studies teachers because it's a requirement, obviously statewide, but through the legislature. And we have the benefit of having this preparation. So um, again, kudos to and all of your team. And just want to express my appreciation. Thank you, Dr. Farouk. Mr. Hunt. Well, again, Dr. Farouk took my notes. It sounds like, um, but I do commend the board and this district and you, Dr. Lewis, that. We will be two years ahead of the state's plan. So it will be a graduation requirement for us. Is that in 27, did you say? 28, 27? 2028. 2028. And uh, this will be offered at, at, at what levels again, please? These are classes 9 through 12. Uh, 9 through 12. And uh, I do encourage you, as Dr. Farouk, just uh, we have a unique opportunity to connect now something wanted for a long time with our indigenous uh, folks that live in, that were founded in this area, that read the Trujillos when they showed up, let alone De Anza. And uh, so I'm, I'm glad you're going to reach out to them. They're a very important part of history. And uh, I, I really, now when the uh, curriculum comes out, as you begin to develop it, will it be available for community to examine like we did with the math curriculum recently? So I will do my best to answer this one, but uh, if you'd like more detail, I'm sure Mrs. Power will help. So number one, all of the instructional material that we're currently using for social science is already on public display. So anybody who would like to see that, it's at the grant site. The hour has been posted on the website. They can go in and look at all of that material. The additional resources on behalf of ethnic studies that we've talked about, they are building an ethnic studies website or an eth eth uh, Google Classroom, and depending on the platform, where everything will be listed that we're available to put. So scope and sequence, materials, or things of that nature. Anything you'd like to add to that? Okay, thank you. You trained me well. It, it does. Uh, uh, but, uh, and if, if I look at these, and of course we are teaching our Chicano studies and African American, but if I go to, as we go along, we build this curriculum. Uh, if I want to make a, if a member of the public would like to make a comment on it, uh, other than scratching it out or something, how, how would they do that, sir? How, how would they, other than coming here and taking three minutes, but if they want to go into more detail, how, how does, what is our process of that? And I would just relate it to like we did with our math adoptions. And I think we had an early reading adoption last year, I believe it was. So with all the adoptions, if parents or community members have two options. Number one, they can come review the material on their own. Mm -hmm. If they would like a staff member to be with them to answer questions, walk through material, they're happy to do that. Uh, as well as when you see the ethnic studies breakdown, there will be contact information for Mrs. Power and her team. Feel free to reach out to them, provide input, ask questions. We're happy to explain um, rationale, direction, or where we're headed through this journey. I just want to give them the opportunity to make an intelligent uh, opportunity to, to look at it in a way that's comprehensive and not, unfortunately, as it is across America right now, uh, this critical race uh, uh, fire, you know, flash fire that everyone's concerned about. And we've been very clear on this board when we adopted the resolution well before Mr. Medina bill was signed two years prior. And we included Asians and uh, you know, the erratas and all of that we've had here. And so I, I'm very glad the way we're going, just let's keep it that and allow that the public can view it and understand it well so they can make uh, informed uh, decisions and observations. Thank you for doing that. Thank you, sir. I appreciate it. Thank you, ma'am. Ms. Alvey or Mr. Kinnear, do you have anything before I call on Dr. Farouk again? Do you have any? Do you have anything, Mr. Kinnear, on this before I call on Dr. Farouk again? No. Okay. Did you have something else, Dr. Farouk? I was just going to make a very quick comment, just to what Trustee Hahn was saying about the community having access to the curriculum. Is that I, correct me if I'm wrong? But the reason why uh, one it is accessible and transparent in terms of, like you said, the parents can come uh, on site and view the curriculum. But the reason why they have to physically come is for licensing, publisher, 
issues that you can't just be putting out their content uh, electronically. Is that correct? And if you can just explain that, because I think it's important the public understands that. I'd actually like Mrs. Power to talk about some of the resources they've built so those that are not able to come down, uh, some of the supports they've tried to provide. So when we're thinking about the curriculum, it depends on if it's published, publisher created, then it depends on the publisher. So this is kind of looking ahead for those that are in our, um, our current textbook adoption. The publishers have made those available and we've put those um, out on social media for people to have access. It, the links is what I mean. For our in-house created materials that are going along with the ethnic studies, um, those could be made available online as well because they're not, they're not copyrighted necessarily, right? Because they are specifically created from within. So we could definitely make those available as well. Thank you, that's all I wanted. Mr. Kinnear? Yeah. Check, the, uh, check the current link for some of our history social science textbooks. Uh, when, uh, when I looked at some of our, uh, the link for our core social science uh, um, courses, it, it didn't take me to, uh, to those, so there might, there might be a problem. It could also be me, too. So. Um, all right, a couple questions for me. So just to clarify, um, the ethnic studies requirement uh, is going to be a, a graduation requir requirement for 2028, and it's one semester or it's a one year? The requirement is one semester. Uh, for our resolutions by 2028. Okay, so these the, the ethnic studies course that's being proposed, um, and I know we have the the existing courses with African American studies and Chicano studies. Uh, isn't there a semester course and also at least I think with African American studies it's a year long course option as well. Uh, at this point, they're all planned to be semester electives. Okay, I know. In, semi-related. I mean, I think we started down this road about two years ago, and we were looking at um, how can we limit the, the rigidity of the student uh, choice and what they take. Um, and I think, I know I asked about if there was an option, because um, other districts were doing it, to have you know, like Chicano studies or African American studies um, meet the requirements of U.S. history. Uh, so that a student could take either or. And, we, and I know we explored that because other, other districts had done that. Um, and then once the board took the resolution on this ethnic studies um, requirement, and now with the passage of AB 101, are, are we still working on that? Or has that been uh, put to the side for now? It definitely has not been put to the side. Still something when we talked about researching and expanding. It is still on our horizon, something we are still talking to other districts, talking to our teachers, seeing how that would incorporate. We'll be happy to bring back an update and uh, that will continue throughout 2022 to gather that input and bring a recommendation back at a later date. Okay, uh, thanks. <clears throat> I mean, I'm, I'm excited about uh, this, this opportunity for our students. Uh, I mean, I'm just doing the quick math here. My oldest, I think, will be the second class that will, this will be re required. Um, and. My oldest loves history, so I think he would do these classes regardless um, of the requirement or not. Um, but my understanding is that AB 101 does give us flexibility that a student doesn't have to just take ethnic studies, but they could take um, any coursework that mirrors the, the, I don't know what you call them, the, the blocks of information that need to be taught in that class. That's, is that correct? So that's still part of the new legislation I was alluding to earlier. Uh, there are many different components, and one thing we'll learn over the course of the next two to three years is we'll be able to get into the weeds of that legislation and find out exactly what meets the requirement, uh, but we'll be poised as a district to go either direction as that unfolds over the next few years. All right, I think my, my desire is that students still have some choice in, in some of the uh, the options that are provided with, within the framework of, of our resolution and also within the framework of the assembly bill. Um, you know, we heard from Mr. Karina, who's on the committee, about students wanting to um, be able to relate to the curriculum in which they're taking or be exposed to being exposed to maybe curriculum that, um, based upon their life experience, they wouldn't have. 
so I, I really do think it's important that with all the requirements that students have uh, to graduate from high school, uh, that we try to give as much latitude so that students can have more of a college experience, right? Because once you get to college, students kind of can select uh, the courses in which they take. Uh, that's not to take away from, from the, the foundation that is required in US history should we make other options available for that. I mean, there needs to be some building blocks that are in, in every one of these courses. Um, but there's so much rich history, so many different perspectives that our students can benefit from. And I think that was the point of AB 101, is that students have the option, uh, or students are required uh, to have the opportunity to learn about these different perspectives, uh, giving them some selection within that, I think is really important. Uh, so I think I'm okay uh, initially having, uh, you know, ethnic diversity being the choice until we fine tune some of these other courses. But I think it's really imperative um, if we're gonna be on the front end of making this a requirement and being on the front end of recruiting um, talented educators to teach this, <clears throat> that we look at this as an opportunity to be uh, creative and innovative um, so our students can experience uh, history from a different perspective um, that's appealing to them. Uh, and I also think it's important to still focus on um, U.S. history uh, to, to, to continue to teach the basic principles. I don't want to change, I'm not trying to change history. But uh, again, as one of our speakers alluded to, there's a lot of history that's left out of our books now. Um, so being able to, to give students different perspective, even within the current required courses, I think would be uh, important. Um, and I think, I think that's all I have. Anybody, Mr. Hunt? Yes, thank you, Ms. Lee. I, I really appreciate those comments. Just to, for one, I, I took ethnic studies in high school. It's one of the, I can remember very well, one of the things that our teacher did was has us bring in different speakers and uh, from different races that, and, ha and how they were involved. So I hope you will consider that. I, I, uh, I don't remember how I did it, but I got a Black Panther uh, representative to come in, and it was very interesting. But I have a, only because, and I'm, a, I'm having lunch soon with my good friend Jose, who wrote this legislation, and I and I want to be able to answer him. He said in the newspaper uh, recently that he was disappointed that RUSD's program hadn't gone far enough. And have you had a chance to speak to him as to what that is, or am I going to be waiting to hear from him, or or can you just help me out? I mean, I respect Jose and. All of that, but why didn't it go far enough? Um, Doesn't it go far enough? In early stages, Mr. Hunt, um, you might, if you turn off your mic, then we won't. Oh, echo thank you, ma'am. Um, uh, we had talked about, um, there was a difference among the three courses. I think that's when we talked that there was a difference among the three courses, that was one thing. And then um, uh, we were talking about embedding. Um, different perspectives in U.S. history uh, as a choice for students. And at the time, Assembly Member Medina, it, it wasn't what he conceptualized when, after I talked to him. It wasn't what he conceptualized when he proposed the bill. Um, and so since, even with our, our teachers and with other feedback, um, we have this plan. So I talked to him day before yesterday, I think, about this plan, and he's cool. So you're, you're good to have a great lunch. Good lunch, <laughs> I do want to remind Mr. Lee that it was Churchill who said, Victor's right to history, and I intend to write it. And there is much in history that uh, needs to be told that is, under, that is lying underneath the, the words today. And we do need to have a more honest presentation about our, our founding and uh, the development of this great nation that Washington called it his farewell address. And he said, it will be interesting to see how our little experiment works. And so I, I think it will be important. And I, and I really do believe that this ethnic studies, because it will begin to really be honest about slavery and, and uh, uh, flight of the Asian coming here and, and uh, uh, all of the, you know, the immigrants, I think it will really help advance the changes in American history to be more upfront so we're not doomed to repeat it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hunt. I don't see any other comments from the board. 
Um, we don't need any action on this item right or any direction. So thank you to you and the team and uh, your committee. Let's give them a round of applause. All right, so I think that concludes our, our uh, agenda. Uh, so that brings us to the end. Um, are there any requests from the board for future agenda items? All right, I don't see any. Oh, Mr. Kinnear. I'd like to, to see a future agenda item where we can provide a direction to our superintendent on the Riverside County Transportation Committee, uh, Committee's e EIR, if I said that, that correctly. Um, our, uh, our district leadership, in terms of administration, has started to provide uh, that feedback. Uh, but I think this board uh, should, should take some positions uh, that, uh, that, that support our ideas uh, on what we think uh, should be happening with, uh, with that transportation hub. So I'd like to see that on a future agenda so that we can give comment. Thank you, Mr. Kinnear. Anybody else have any future agenda items? All right. Um, so tonight that we'll, we'll, we'll come to an adjournment and we do want to uh, adjourn this meeting in uh, honor of uh, at least three individuals who meant a lot to this district. You have two. Okay. Um, we adjourn our, our meetings very often in memory of former employee and, and uh, you know, Lu Luciana, uh, our USD is 4,000 employees and about uh, 200 or so retire every year. Go by 20 years, you're, you know, you've got 8,000 folks. And there's not an alumni association of, uh, though they're very collaborative and, and work together. So we usually find out about it. Some of us older ones watch the obits. And some, you know, there's always someone who said, I, I worked with her or him, and, and so that's nice. And it wasn't that long ago that sitting in that chair that when I came, we came across, a, it was a former poly teacher, a lady that had passed. And as I was reading when she retired, I thought, well, that's when Kathy was there, Valerie. And I asked her, and it was just, I was so moved that she was able to talk about that person. Unfortunately, in some ways we've, unfortunately, period. In the last over seven day period, we lost two of our employees, one of them an active gentleman who's actively working, and the other one, a retired uh, lady that had been part of this district for many years. She just retired in 2020. So reached out, and Mr. Lee's uh, okay, to friends of theirs, and Adriana Carell, who's been our PTA president and longtime school volunteer, uh, helped us out first with the, uh, the gentleman. You recall that uh, the Arlington student rep mentioned this fine man in her closing comments tonight, very emotional. Uh, John D. Guzman, or John T., our coach, as he was often and lovingly referred to, born on April 22nd, 1980, in the Philippines. He began his career as a part-time substitute campus supervisor and eventually landing a permanent position in Arlington High School. John was very thrilled about that. It was his career dream. He uh, had thought about and even began to discuss becoming a teacher, which we support in this district. John raved about the students and the staff there at Arlington. He had been very accepted by all. He loved working with, with the young people and getting to know the students and earning their trust. He wore his Arlington Lion staff shirts as proudly as he wore his poly coaching shirts. And what, what about that is that John uh, had volunteered when he was working at Bank of America and gone to uh, our athletic director, Jim Vaughn, over at Poly and asked if he could be considered to be a coach because his son here tonight with us uh, had been, uh, was on the Poly freshman team and, and Jim hired him and, and uh, he and others, uh, Mr. Rowe, when he was there, began to notice what a fine young gentleman he was and uh, he came on as a full-time campus supervisor and then was uh, relocated uh, for his happiness to Arlington High School, where the Yabar and others were very good to him. Um, John was a friend to many, including Adriana and, and the, a lot of the kids that they grew up with. He had a tough, troubled youth, some have, and uh, but he remained close to, the, to this group. Uh, when
and his son Jaden's mother died unexpectedly in 2010. John took on the challenging road of, uh, of raising Jaden as a single father. Very passionate about raising his son and providing him with all the love and support and opportunities there are. He loved that he had the opportunity to coach him in, in football and over at, uh, excuse me, uh, over there at Poly, and uh, which he said was one of the highlights of his life. Uh, in addition to Jaden, 2020 graduate of Poly High School here tonight, 19 year old young man. John also has three younger children. Six-year-old Gotti, Connie's with us tonight. Juliet Lydia, Lydia, two years old. John touched many lives in Corona, Norco, and Riverside areas and was loved by many. Impacted through his loss and uh, tough things he went through. Some of us who have suffered from depression understand where, where John was. And so we'll close tonight along with another I'll read in a moment in John D. Guzman's uh, memory. And we thank you, Adriana, for putting this together. The other person we will be talking about tonight for a moment is, uh, is Don Smith. Don was a longtime educator at RUSD and uh, retired only in 2020 as the uh, principal at, uh, at Franklin Elementary. I reached out to our former colleague, Mrs. Alavi and uh, Gail Cloud, and very close to her. And I know you and others could read this better than I, I could because so many knew her. Renee, Kylie, um, I know we all, all worked with her. Uh, Gail writes, first of all, I want to thank you all tonight for closing in Don's memory. Family appreciates it. Here are some ideas or some impacts on her career and thoughts on her life. Don Smith was a forge of nature. She was determined to provide the best possible education for her students. She could not be deterred. Don finished her BA in teaching credential after she had, had had her four children. That's well, there's determination. Uh, Mrs. Smith began teaching at Arupa, where she stayed for four years before she came to Riverside Unified. Don Smith began teaching at Pachapa Elementary in 1996. From Pachapa, she transferred to uh, John F. Kennedy Elementary and spent one year later at Earhart Middle School and where and she particularly loved, uh, Gail mentioned, teaching fifth grade where she immersed her students in early American history, which she was very involved in and loved very much. She also proved to be an outstanding administrator and she became an assistant principal at Alcott Elementary and in her final position with our district and for several years she was our principal at Franklin Elementary. Uh, she was a passionate advocate, and I've always admired her for this because I love core knowledge, and it is difficult to bring a staff around. It's a change. It takes different, but she was a passionate advocate for core knowledge. She had both uh, worked over in bringing core knowledge to Bryant and to Adams, and uh, she brought it in in record time in, to Franklin. Principal Smith made sure the Franklin teachers had the support they needed to implement this challenging curriculum so her kids would soar academically. Don was also very passionate about the orderly environment of, of her campuses and to give a child, as we've often talked about, uh, a place they were proud to go to school that was attractive and uh, uh, welcoming. Uh, Don had many special interests, interest, uh, but mostly uh, he was uh, her interest. Don education was being the wife for forty something years of one man, Jeff, her husband, and she was the mother. She is the mother of four children: Jade, Ashley, AJ, and Cody. All these young people are RUSD grads who have done well in their own right. Gail reports. And the highlight of her life, especially after retirement in 2020, and I look forward to this and Mrs. Alavan too, but were her nine grandchildren. And uh, she relished her role as Mimi. Whether she was called Mrs. Smith, Principal Smith, Don, or Mimi, she was someone Gail reports she would reckon she would be reckoned with because she was a woman of a principal integrity. Kind, compassionate, articulate, and tenacious. I'll agree with that. Uh, 
She always acted on her beliefs. She volunteered at her church and in our community, Riverside Life Services and other organizations, and with anyone who would need her help and reach out. Don, as I said, was a loving wife, uh, an example of a, of a dedicated citizen and someone to emulate to her children, and Gail and to many others, um, a faithful friend. There is not one in these groups, Gail reminds us, who will not fill the void that Don Smith leaves behind. Uh, Gail reports she lived out her faith and no doubt as she took her final breath early Wednesday morning here on earth, took her first to heavens, heard, well done, good and faithful servant. And Mr. Lee, with your approval, we will close tonight in memory and the honor of two of our employees that gone too soon, Mr. Guzman. Yeah. Um, yeah, Mr. Hunt, I just unfortunately have, with regret, one more um, RUSD lost this week, also from Arlington High School, uh, Coach John Jack Harrison. Uh, it is with great sadness that we announce the passing of John Robert Harrison, also known as Jack, who was born in September 1949, and he passed away just last week on December 9th. Jack was a husband, father, grandfather, uncle, brother, and a friend. Uh, he was born uh, in Flin Flon, Manitoba, and moved to California in 52. Jack attended Rubio High School, where he graduated in 1967. After high school, he attended Kansas State Teachers College and the University of California at Riverside, where he graduated with his degree uh, in arts and education in 71. He proceeded to get his teaching credential in 1977 and began teaching at Arlington High School in 1973 uh, and later re received a master's degree at Azusa Pacific University. He was a teacher and a coach at Arlington High School for 25 years before becoming the school's athletic director in 98. During his time at Arlington, he coached football, baseball, and golf. In 1990, he won a CIF championship as the defensive coordinator for the Arlington Lions football team. While working as an athletic director, the Arlington baseball team won a CIF and state championship in 99. Jack retired in 2008. In February of 2011, Jack was selected to the Citrus Belt Area Athletics Directors Association's Hall of Fame for his many years of service to athletics at Arlington and his contribution to athletics in the Inland Empire. Jack enjoyed watching his grandkids play sports, playing poker, and was a lifelong Angels and Rams fan. He also enjoyed traveling in his motorhome cross country with his wife and trusty companion, Logan. Jack leaves behind his loving wife, Rosalind, sons Dustin, Aaron, Robert, grandchildren, Aiden, Dylan, Sean, Olivia, and Maya. Jack was preceded by his parents, uh, and he leaves behind his sister, uh, Cheryl. Um, so, so, Mr. Hunt, with, with that, I'd like to close in honor John T., Don, and Coach Harrison, um, and we wish, wish their families well, and they're in our thoughts. So. That is me, so. Oh, yeah. I couldn't bring you stuff to find because you're.